you see these ebbs, ebb and flow of the industry. Don't do cardio. Now cardio is back again. Uh, don't do stretching. Stretching comes in, stretching goes out. Like static stretching is good. Now it's bad. Now it's all dynamic stretching. No, that's not good. It's ballistic stretching. It's like everything is a tool and everything has its use. So it just depends on what you're trying to get out of it. So for now, like right now, I'm trying to get mobility and flexibility back. So that's the main emphasis of what I'm doing. And it's because I've just come off a pretty, pretty hard cycle of lifting, which I haven't lifted much in the last two years because I've been doing a lot of cycling and running. And uh, just decided, you know, as I'm getting older, it's only going to be beneficial to be able to maintain good range of motion in the joints and good flexibility. So now on the terms of like using static versus more dynamic, just depends on what you're doing. A lot of people will say don't do static stretching before you lift, but there's a couple of things you can think about here. A, if the static stretching allows me to get into positions that I can't get into, that's a benefit. Even if we, if we assume that it reduces your strength and your power production, so what? If I can't get in the position, I can't get in the position. So if doing stra static stretching over time creates biological tissue change and allows me to get deeper into a position, that's always gonna be a benefit, okay? So anytime you focus on one thing, when you're training, you're going to have to make compensations and you're going to, you're going to have to just understand that some things are going to kind of fall back. You got to maintain that stuff. But in order to progress really rapidly in one area, you have to give it a lot of attention. So if my desire right now is to be able to get into the splits, then I'm going to need to use whatever tool is going to get there. So static stretching, dynamic stretching, both passive and assisted. The key is to not get married to anything. Now, because I'm about to train, I'm not going to hold these positions very long. So there's going to be a lot of dynamic movement in it and holding positions for like, say, 15 seconds. I'm not opposed to holding it longer because, the, again, the goal is range of motion and to be able to get there. So I'm not too fussed about how strong I am right now, right? I mean, I can still deadlift 200 and some kilos. I can still squat close to 200. I can bench press close to 150. Strength, I'm not at a strength deficit. And I'm 40, just turned 46. I don't give a shit about, I'm not, I don't have aspirations of getting back on, on the, on the powerlifting platform or doing a bodybuilding show. Um, I do have aspirations of feeling good and moving good and putting a lot of investment into my retirement fund for not being crippled later because I'm too busy powerlifting or too busy doing something else. So, um, Right now, the goal is to get into a back bridge, front, uh, front splits on both sides, middle splits, um, and then maintain that while I work on strength stuff. And I'm doing a lot of gymnastic skill work right now, which requires to progress, you have to have a certain amount of flexibility, and you have to be strong in that flexible position. So something I was talking to a client about earlier, he's a power lifter, and he was having some shoulder issues, back issues, things like that. We spent the first six to eight weeks of his prep doing a lot of mobility work. And something he said to me a few days ago, um, his last meet, he benched three thir 337 pounds and he missed three, I think he missed 345 or 347. Well, we're pretty much hit his meat max three or four weeks before his, his uh, meet. So one of the things that he noticed was that because he had poor shoulder extension, horizontal shoulder extension, the weight was, it was hard to get off his chest. It was, felt really heavy. There's a concept when you look at length tension in a muscle and also joint angle. If you don't have good range of motion, that becomes your length in a weakened position. So if, if this is my normal range of motion and the bar gets to here, I have a drop off in strength. Now, if my range of motion is back here, when I get here, I still have all of this wiggle room. So now I don't, I'm not in a position of being weak. I'm still in a fairly mid-range coming to LinkedIn position. So it's not like we did anything. We didn't bench for two months. So it's not like we did anything highly specific to the bench to get his bench up. I just improved his range of motion 15 to 20 degrees this way, and his strength automatically went up because now – 
he's got more wiggle room. He's got more buffer area. Now the key is for a power lifter is during those early those early phases when you're far away from a meet is try to get mobile while maintaining strength. That way you have that extensibility of the muscle and you can get that joint angle. Now, as we get close to the meat, we have to go the opposite direction. So we have to purposely try to make him as tight as possible to give him more leverage in that position. He'll still be able to get to this position, but now he can get to that position without the weight push him in, into a position that he doesn't own, which is important, right? So here's some of the dynamic stuff. So we'll start going, like moving in and out of positions. And we'll go back and forth to short static stretches. When I'm doing the static stretches, I'm not, also I'm not being passive. I'm being very active. So on that side straddle, when I go on a side straddle, I'm not just leaning over. I'm trying to use my hips to pull myself into a deeper position. So we can look at dynamic and we can look at static. But we can also look at things like passive and active stretching. If I'm doing a passive stretch, let's say I'm not using any muscles to pull myself down. I'm just leaning over into a hamstring stretch. That's going to be more passive. Nothing inherently wrong with that, especially if you're going to hold a static stretch. But if I want to take advantage of the muscles on the opposite side of the joint, I can pull myself into a deeper stretch. So if I come here, and that's my passive range. I can hold this, try to pre-fatigue the posterior chain. Then I can use my hips to start pulling myself into a deeper range. That way we modify link tension across the joint with antagonistic muscles. So both of those are going to create um, a situation where the joint can now be free to move into that position without losing strength, right? But a lot of the people we deal with have link tension issues between antagonistic muscles. So one muscle might be overly shortened or hypertonic. The other one is hypotonic or it's too lengthened. So you get bones that rotate out of position. If we want to reverse that, we can use both stretching and strengthening to get there and we can layer those in together. So a lot of the arguments that people have with stretching where it doesn't work is because they're not doing the stretching correctly and not combining it with other things. If I increase joint angle, I'm going to have a weakness in that new range of motion. But if I combine that stretching with weighted mobility, now I can reestablish stability and control and strength in that new range of motion. The, the, the most important thing is that once you increase that range of motion, slowly strengthen that progressively. Don't try to, don't use your one rep max if you've opened 25 degrees of range of motion and then try to go to that new range of motion, you still have to build strength in that new position and making sure that you're trying to get into as much range over time as you can, as long as it's not overly excessive for what you wanna do, All right? So now if I go into standing pike, this can be considered passive, but what I can also do is I can pull myself further using my quads and my hip flexors and that creates more active stretch between or active stretch in the hamstrings by utilizing the muscles in the front of the hip. Uh, right. Now, this is the one that I find more people need side to side squats and then eventually going into Cossack squats because most people are training sagittally and they don't have any frontal plane range of motion or frontal plane strength, which is super important. I think something like this, using, um, using a more dynamic and active type of warm-up um, as your modality and, and also as your conditioning, because these movements here, the way I'm doing them, um, they look easy because I'm used to doing it, but you take this into like our gym, IOPC, this would ab absolutely cripple most of our clients because they're coming from such a low level of strength, low level of stability, low level of control, and a low level of range of motion. Um, so a lot of this stuff will improve strength dramatically and can also increase hypertrophy, especially for people who 
we deal with at, at our, our gym, which are people who are relatively untrained and just want to feel better and move better. Like they don't have aspirations of doing a bodybuilding show or competition. Uh, we have over a hundred members. I think probably five or six that actually care about getting really strong. Um, most of them would just be happy making themselves feel better and also trying to offset some of the pizza and beer they're having on the weekends, right? And I had to, I had a big pill to swallow when we uh, opened the gym because I was writing these beautiful routines, periodized programs. They were getting really strong. And a lot of people go, this, we don't really care about this. I'm like, look how strong you're getting. They're like, yeah, I don't really care. I just want to have wine on the weekend and stop getting fat. I'm like, okay. So we had to start thinking more about what our clients actually want to do versus what we think is optimal. Because in gym pop especially, optimal is not gonna work for most people because you're dealing with people who have minimal time to train or minimal desire to train and their goals aren't necessarily the same goals of what you would see with like a personal trainer. Like we live for this stuff. Like it's nothing for me to train two hours a day and I love it. You're never gonna get gym pop people to do that unless they're from an athlete background or they're, they're like an amateur weekend warrior athlete. I hate this one. And just to give credit, a lot of the stuff I do with this um, is from a buddy of ours, Coach Christopher Sommer, who uh, his website's gymnasticbodies.com. I think his, for the money, if you're interested in this stuff, his yearly subscription is not expensive, and most of the stuff that I do from him or that I've modified from him with this stuff is fantastic. So it's, a, it's actually a really good deal if you're interested in this type of work. Now, I don't do everything completely like his, but like this extended warm-up routine is one of his, and uh, I rate it really highly. But uh, also, when you look at there's individual differences from between people on what they're going to respond to. His gymnastics program, there are things that are easy to do, and the progression regression structure is really good and easy. No, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's set up well. It, it, is, it caters really well for high-level athletes who are doing the skill work and people who respond to intensity, which I've always responded really well to intensity. I don't respond well to high time under tension. I don't respond well to like traditional hypertrophy and strength endurance work. I respond well to like intensities of 85% up to 140%. So a lot of this stuff, especially some of the stretch series, it might be a little too much initially for gen pop and it takes a long time to progress. But as you do it, if you're consistent and you're patient, um, it works really fast. But, um, Stuff by him, I like, you know, stuff by, um, what's his name? Oh, I can't remember his name, but Overcoming Gravity has some good stuff. Kit Laughlin, there's a lot of people that have good stuff, but I've always been a fan of Coach's work because I know him, and I've seen the difference in what his programs have done for me. And I can remember when I met him, I had been a big fan for years, and I met him, and I had horrible shoulder pain in my right shoulder and uh, I was in the middle of a bench press session using I don't know 365 pounds or so for five sets of five and I talked to him about this and he goes well why don't you put a, a set of shoulder dislocation between every bench press set and I go well that doesn't make any sense because it's going to make me weaker and he goes yeah it will make you weaker initially however you will adapt to it over time so you might have like month and a half, two month period where you may have to take some weight off the five by five, but your shoulder will feel better and then your strength will go back up. And I went, okay, you know, I think you're full of shit, but all I can do is try it. And I did, and sure as shit, I lost like 100 pounds off my bench in the first month and a half, two months. And at about the ninth, ninth week mark, I had no shoulder pain and my bench went back up to 365 for five sets of five. And that was one of the elements that I, that I uh, stole from him with credit of how I created our back-loaded and front-loaded structural balance templates where we do 
a little bit different than him, we'll do a stretch movement straight into a strength movement, which is, uh, goes against what everyone in the industry tells you because everybody's too busy jacking off the papers instead of trying stuff out. Um, and we find it works fantastically well. It's like what I said earlier, if you don't have the range to get into a position, the mechanics aren't there for some reason, why do you care if stretching is gonna make you weaker temporarily? Because at least you can start getting into a better position. And if you can get into a better position that's more optimal for the lift, guess what's gonna happen when you remove the stretching or, or when you adapt to it? You're gonna get stronger. But now you're not gonna feel like a bag of dicks. All right. So I've been sitting in this too long. I'm gonna lose all this strength. Oh my God. It's just, it's, it just baffles me that people, people get way too evidence-based where they don't actually read the studies and so though stretching doesn't work. Yeah, they did a really hard stretch and immediately did a, a vertical jump. Of course, they just pre-fatigued and did a contrast set with stretching and jumping. Of course, the power output's gonna go down. But now, do that same stretch, then throw in some dynamic stretches, rest for five or 10 minutes, then do a vertical jump and see if your performance goes down. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But the body is a, has a really, really robust way of overcoming um, overcoming adversity. So even though you might get a temporary deficit in some areas by focusing on other things, your body will figure a way to get around that over time. Where was I here? Okay. And I've only been stretching again for about three weeks and I'm already almost in, uh, what gymnasts would call a bullshit front split on uh, one side because my hips aren't square, but I could not get anywhere close to that a few weeks ago. And part of that is just doing the work years ago to be able to get there. And even though you lose it, if you stop, once you start doing it again, it comes back rapidly, but that could be said about any adaptation. If you go out and you run a 22 minute, 5k and then you stop running for a year you're not going to run a 22 minute 5k anymore if you bench press 150 kilos and you stop bench pressing for a year you're not going to bench press 150 kilos you're going to go on a bench 120 but if you spend two months benching again it's a lot easier to get back to that 150 and that's one of the arguments people talk about stretching as well as well it only works while you're doing it yeah no shit so does squatting benching and deadlifting Stop doing that and watch all your gains go away for a while. Uh, hypertrophy, you grow muscle, stop training for a year, watch all that muscle go away. But it does come back. So it's just a really, people make really weird arguments about this stuff. I can get, this is the nice thing about nowadays, is that we have training software, training management software. We have phones that are almost as good as cameras. So the way we do online training is, drastically different than when I first started, because I started in 2007 or so, when there wasn't really anybody doing online training, and we were using like email, Word documents, and fax machines. So we were still on dial-up, I think, at that time. And uh, I, I just had to trust somebody was doing things right. Now, all of our clients, we use training software, and our clients will send us videos so I can make sure that they're doing things correctly. And if I don't think they're doing and they don't send videos, I'll specifically request a video of what they're doing to make sure that what I'm envisioning is exactly what they're doing. Because I train mainly coaches, and when I get a coach to train, I never know how they learned how to squat. So my interpretation of how a squat should be done for them might be completely different because they might have learned from someone who only knows one type of squat and doesn't know how to modify the squat for that person. So I need to see, at least see an initial video and say, okay, we can probably, this doesn't look exactly like I want. So we can do our modifications then, changing the stance, changing the grip, bar placement, loading. You may even find I've got clients where they're really excellent front squatters and they're terrible back squatters. It's like, well, I want to make their back squat better, but the front squat's going to give them a much better return, so we'll get their front squat really strong and then bring their back squat. So that's the nice thing about modern technology is 
I get to see all that stuff. I don't have to worry about whether they're doing it correctly or not. I only have to worry if they're not sending me the, the videos because I can only, I can only coach if I'm, if I'm actually seeing what they're doing. Ooh. So I've, if you're doing stretching too, and you find like something like a, a pike or a pancake, something like that is hard, um, or you barely got any range of motion, it's always a benefit to use something like a yoga block. This is not a yoga block. This is kind of a quasi board press thing you can attach to a bar, but I like this one because it's solid. Um, but you can use yoga blocks or you can use a bench to elevate your bum. If you elevate your hips, you can get on a much deeper stretch. It's kind of like going from somebody has a range of motion deficiency and say like a split squat on the floor. An easy way to overcome that is do front foot elevated split squat. It reduces range of motion demand. It increases their ability to load the movement. So you do say um, front foot elevated split squat on a 12 inch high box, get really strong there, deload the weight a little bit, take a few inches off the box, get it strong again, and eventually you can get them to the floor. So if you have a range of motion deficiency, use training tools like this or a box or a bench, get really bendy in that position and then slowly lower yourself back to the floor. It's a really easy way to get a lot of success instead of just going straight to the floor and then struggling for months to try to get into position. Maybe you've gone from an elevated hip position and you work yourself down to the floor, work the floor for a while, and you maybe you don't see, like you're not progressing really well. Just elevate your hips again and keep working on that position. So that's what I'm doing here with these seated pikes. So elevating my hips, I'm able to get into a deeper position and I'm able to rock my hips into it so that I can actually keep the tension where it's supposed to go. <clears throat> I'm like, I couldn't do this three weeks ago. No fucking way. That practice, perfect practice makes perfect, right? So a lot of times with mobility stuff too, you want to be really patient. Just like with strength training, um, people get people get a, a bit overzealous. You want to work to a point of discomfort, but not too much. So I found a quote last night. I don't know if it might be Coach Sommer's quote. I'm not sure, but it's like you want to basically kind of go to the edge of intensity without actually going to the edge of full intensity, something like, I'm paraphrased, something like that is basically, you should be seeking to get to that, the most intense place you can get, but basically you wanna back off from that a little bit. So stretching shouldn't be, if you're trying to get really bendy and mobile, it shouldn't be mild, it shouldn't be, unless you're doing something like Pavel's relax in a stretch, which is also good, just sitting in a position for as long as you can handle this comfortable position, watching TV, using indigenous resting postures, things like that, and just get your brain used to being in that position. But when you're actually training flexibility, just like with strength training, you're going to need a certain level of intensity if you want to progress and if you want to progress fast. But if you push that too fast, your body's going to respond by getting even tighter. So if you had somebody that wanted to do, say, the split, you don't want to just like, we don't want to go back to like Van Damme blood sport shit and attach ropes to them and try to stretch them out. Um, you want to do this slowly and methodically over time and let the brain figure out how to relax in that position so that that position feels comfortable um, and not try to push it. If you had somebody that wanted to bench 150 kilos and they can only bench say 75, you wouldn't put 150 on it and just go, all right, let's fucking pray that this doesn't fall and crush your neck or your head you would slowly build that strength over time. And it's also important when you're doing this, you wanna hit stretching from a lot of different positions. Like I said with people usually spend most of their time training in a sagittal plane, bench squat, deadlift, overhead. They don't spend enough time doing side to side movements. Like the only frontal plane movement you see a lot of people doing, lateral raises. So, it just goes to say that you should be thinking outside the box, like side step ups, side to side squats, doing caustic squats, things like that. If you wanna keep everything feeling good, it's like on this, I've got this straight line stretch. I could do this, I could also roll my leg and just try to hit that from 
a lot of different angles, but then from here, moving to this middle position because it's giving a different stretch response. So um, one thing I learned from Charles Poliquin way back in the day when I was his student is the concept of three-dimensional stretching, doing things and rotating and moving to different positions. And he wasn't a massive fan of stretching, but if, well, I would say this, if you, if you read articles, he wasn't a massive fan of stretching, but if you spent enough time with him like I did, he wasn't opposed to stretching, but he wanted to use stretching for specific purpose. So he used a lot of dynamic, ballistic, three-dimensional stretching, more PNF style stretching, things like that, because that was gonna be more productive for an athlete who's already training his sport and his skill work and also having to do his strength work and his conditioning work. You know, you only have limited resources. So from that, he would be right to say that stretching for an athlete might need to be integrated into things or we might need to find stuff that's specific towards the task of, again, getting into a position or ramping something up. But we need to get better at not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and uh, just demonizing things because of our bias. The only problem nowadays is that's not great for marketing. Everyone has to be very myopic and one-sided because people love a good debate. Especially the nastier you get and the more name calling, the more people froth for it. So that's what you see on Instagram. If you take the Bruce Lee approach of uh, you know, trying everything out, keeping what's useful and rejecting what's useless, that's not great for marketing. So this is why we suck at marketing, me and Zoe. Until now, but still, I will always have a problem with having a one-sided dogmatic viewpoint of things. To me, everything's a tool. So I remember years ago, I had a rental house that was on a septic tank. I've never lived in a house with a septic tank. I didn't understand it. The seal on my toilet broke, and the bathroom smelt like the inside of the septic tank. So me being a stupid 20-something year old man, decided I could fix this myself. So I went to our Bunnings, which is Home Depot, and I uh, asked the guy what I needed to do this. And he goes, you need a hammer drill, and you need a flange, you need a, so I'm like, okay. I spent probably more money on what I needed to do it myself than I would have spent on a plumber. I got it done, I felt great. That hammer drill, that was the only time I ever used that fucking hammer drill. I spent hundreds of dollars on a hammer drill, used it one fucking time. But that was the tool for the job. So just like that, we need to have lots of these tools. Like you may never use static stretching. You may, may never use dynamic stretching. You may never use any of this stuff. But it's good to understand it so that when you're presented with a problem and you need a solution, you have that tool available even if you only use it once in your life. Yeah, it's especially important for coaches because people are paying you to solve their problems. That's the only reason why someone would pay a god-awful amount of money to go train one-on-one -on -one with somebody. So the only, other, the only other reason someone would pay for that is if they needed the accountability and having that coach is the only reason they would do stuff. I don't train anybody like that. Um, People who train with me don't need an accountability partner, and if they do, they don't last long because I don't parent people. Um, if you can't follow the program, you can't do what I'm asking you to do, that's fine, but I'm not gonna beg and plead you for it. If you're an adult and you can't get your shit done, then maybe we need to reassess your goals and do something else. So like if you wanna get dick skin lean, but you're not willing to be hungry, and you're not willing to track your food, and you're not willing to say no when you really want to say yes, then you're probably, me yelling at you and begging you to, uh, to do your shit is only going to do one thing. It's going to frustrate both of us. And uh, I'm too old for that shit now. So I only train people 
who either get their shit done, or if they don't, they take full responsibility for them not being able to do it. I'll coach you and I'll give you strategies, but I can't be there to slap the donut out of your fucking hand. I can't be there to slap you in the back of the head when you're drinking a beer and you're trying to get lean. I can't do it. I'll offer a service that, man, money talks, so you want to pay me to just, like, follow you around and slap shit and yell at you and make you feel like a piece of shit? I, I'm okay with that, but it's going to be real fucking expensive because I won't be able to train anybody else and I'll be away from my family. So, And that's the thing with bias, right? It's like I have so many tools in my toolbox that – I, you'll see every program for every client is way different. Some people who do gymnastic skill work, some people have never touched it. Some people are doing powerlifting stuff, some people never touch it. It's, you know, it just, everybody's drastically different. They have different stories, they have different goals. So you have to customize their program for what they're looking to do. And the less tools you have, the less ability you have to do things like that, right? If I only know how to power lift, and I have somebody that's coming in for fat loss or general health or wants to run an ultra, you don't know what to do. If you are an ultra marathon runner, somebody wants to power lift, you have no fucking idea how to train them. And to me, that is what, that's what separates really good trainers that are doing it for the right reasons versus trainers doing it for the wrong reasons. The right reason that coach, if they didn't have the skill set, would either refer them to somebody who did, or they would pay another trainer to train that person, and they would learn as an apprenticeship type of thing. But a lot of coaches won't do that because they see it as they don't want to admit that they have a gap in their skill set. So, like, later today, I've got a mentorship student on, and I said this morning, I said, what do you want to talk about so that we don't waste any time, so we can get right into it? He goes, I want to go over, keep going over the stuff we talked about last time, like how stress affects your gut and your metabolism. And also, um, I want to talk about fibromyalgia because I got a client whose gut's fucking fibro. And I said, look, I can't, I can't touch fibro. I don't train people with fibro. I've tried to train like three people with it, and it just drove me fucking bonkers because they feel different every day. Their pain is different every day. You're constantly having to change things. And if it's online, it's a nightmare because I train those fibro people in person so I could immediately change something. But even sometimes if people are really flared up, the smallest fucking thing makes them in massive amounts of pain. And they spend the whole workout complaining about how much pain they're in. So I'm like, I'm not, that's not my thing. So I, I strictly, if you come to me with fibro, we don't, muscle nerds won't train you. I won't train you. Max won't train you. David won't train you because we would rather send you to someone who actually has the scope of knowledge and the scope of practice to deal with that pathology, right? So I told him, I can't I'm not going to talk to you about fiber. I can help you with his gut, and I can help you with things like stress and inflammation, but I can't talk about fibro specifically because I'm not, I'm not your expert for that, right? So I've got a lot of my students will, will get on our program design board and go, hey, I picked up a powerlifter. I've never trained in powerlifting. I don't know anything about it. What do I do? And the, what I tell them every single time is refer them to somebody who trains powerlifters, and you shadow them, and you learn. Don't – this person's going to get on the platform and compete. This is very important to them. You are not the person to help them with this. And they're like, will you help me? I'm like, I will absolutely help you. But you're going to pay a mentorship fee because I'm not going to do your work for you. You should never have taken this client. Here's a list of guys I would recommend that you talk to to see if, if they're willing to let you shadow them. But they need to get paid for it. So what you might need to do is say, well, here's, here's the cost of training. And you give that other trainer 75% of that. You keep 25 And then you do like an ongoing apprenticeship type thing with them. And then you do that with a one or two people you'll at least under, have enough fundamental knowledge of powerlifting where you can do most of the work at that time. But eventually, if that client gets to a level that's above your current powerlifting knowledge, you're going to have to find either that same person or someone who is at a higher level. Uh, because especially when it's highly specific like that, every uh, you're going to have levels of where people are at, and those different levels are going to dictate – usually massively different training schemes, right? So um, 
like getting someone from getting a guy from like an 80 kilo bench press to 120 kilo bench press is different than going from 120 to 150. And then it gets really different going from 150 to 200. And that's coming from somebody who I've, I benched, my max bench was 218. So I can tell you right now what it takes to get there, how hard it is, and how, mu how, how much gear you're gonna have to take to get there. Like, because ain't nobody benching that much without gear, unless they're, unless they're as big as I was back then. And I was on gear, they 200, 124 kilos, or uh, I think it, when I benched, when I benched 218, I was a hundred, a little over, maybe 110 kilos, something like that. So, and, and yeah, I, was, I wasn't gassed out of my mind, but um, I was a minimal effective dose guy when I took gear. So, uh, but it, it, it did take, and it took like, I think it took me uh, 13 years to get to that bench press. It took me 13 or 15 years to get to a 218 bench, a 700 squat, pound squat, uh, 475 pound bench, and a 730 pound deadlift, which those numbers now for that weight class is nothing. Back then that was a pretty big deal, like a 760 pound deadlift in my weight class, which was the, uh, the 242s, a 760 would, would be a national record. Uh, but nowadays that's, that's still a fucking impressive weight, but nowadays you got guys who are, who are deadlifting fucking over 800, 880, which is astronomical and just blows my fucking mind. But it also makes me, almost makes me regret stopping powerlifting because I could have been one of those guys, but I just got bored with it. I got bored back when I was doing powerlifting. Uh, it was in the era where everyone was using crazy custom made supportive gear like triple denim squat suits and shit. And I never squatted in a squat suit. I didn't. I didn't like it, I never deadlifted. I tried to deadlift in a deadlift suit, but it didn't do anything. Um, so I just got rid of it and just trained raw and with wraps. And then, uh, and then my bench, uh, when I was in high school, in 1992 is when I started powerlifting. And I remember those shirts, if anybody's watching this that, uh, that was powerlifting at the time would remember like the old Enzer HD, like an Enzer HD blast. They gave you like 15 pounds, like that's all you could squeeze out of them. Then fast forward to my mid twenties, when I did my biggest bench, I had an Enzer Rage X, which was a, at the time a really extreme shirt. But I'm a I'm also a close grip bencher, so it was really suited for me. But I never trained in it. I bought a brand new shirt. I refused to train in it because I'm like I got really I get really like irritated that people go, hey, I bench 525 pounds, and I'm like, no, you don't. You bench 315. You and the shirt benches. 525. It'd be like, uh, I just broke Usain Bolt's record because I did 100 meters in three seconds and I was wearing rocket, like Bugs Bunny rocket uh, skates on my feet. Like, no, you didn't. Like, um, it, it, we should be setting that standard of understanding the difference between benching raw versus geared. Um, and now I massively respect the guys that are in the shirts just because it's a whole nother element of having to learn how to, how to handle that. But um, st I still think there should be like an asterisk, like a, a Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire asterisk. That's like, you did that with a shirt. But then people could also say, yeah, but you were doing steroids and you benched 218. So should you have an asterisk? Yeah, fine, go ahead. But at least it was me in the bar uh, and not, not any supportive gear. And uh, I still, I use supportive gear now. I've got a Super Ram. I've got one of Mark Bell's slingshots. I use that. I think that they're great for deloading the shoulders and also for overloading part of the range. So I'll use those from time to time. But uh, for me, I like that old school, you just a t-shirt or no shirt at all in the fucking bar. But uh, yeah, but that, yeah, that was a, that was a wild time. I remember my last bench press meet, there's a video of it I've got on YouTube. I posted it on our Instagram stories a while back of me benching 475 in a shirt. That was the first time I ever put that shirt on. So I remember the first lift I think was 420, which was like my max at the time. And uh, I smoked that easily. Then we went up to like 475, I think. And the guy jacked my shirt too much. so he jacking the shirt means you pull the shirt really tight and you put a belt on so it makes it incredibly tight around the chest um 
I brought the bar down and it stopped. I couldn't actually get it to my chest. It was like six inches above. And I was like sitting there with a the bar hovering. I was like, what the fuck do I do? So somebody goes, raise your head. So I raised my head and the bar started to go down and then I dumped it and it almost dislocated both my elbows. So then on the third one, I said, don't jack the shirt so much. And I ended up getting the 475. And then I was like, all right, I'm done with this. I left and I'm done because I got beat. I got beat by a guy that benched 525 who could barely bench 315. I was benching 420, 430 at the time, and I benched 475 in the shirt. And if I had actually known how to use the shirt, I would have won, but I just refused to train it, which looking back is fucking stupid. Um, but then I, I just stopped. Um, yeah, fuck. But I've seen some crazy shit with guys in bench shirts. I saw Tiny Meeker in a single ply benching like 908 pounds. The Tiny Meeker is a enormous human. He went down. He brought the bar up. It got out of the groove, and it pushed it back to his face. Uh, I've never seen a man that large move that fast in my fucking life. I think he's like 300 pounds at the time, and I've, he's like fucking six foot five or six foot six. That dude got off the bench so fast, and the bar slammed into the bench where his head was. But powerlifting was dangerous back then. But... I'm glad to see that um, I'm glad to see that the, the um, raw benching, like raw powerlifting, has come back. I really enjoy seeing like uh, like what Sebastian Orbs guys do, like some of these guys that are uh, what Will Crozier and all those guys do. It's fantastic to see because back then there was no money in uh, raw powerlifting. All the money and the sponsorships came from wearing supportive gear, so people got way fucking out of control with that shit. So today, I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna do some handstand stuff and some ring stuff. So I just want to get my wrist prepared. Now, most of my work that I'm doing is most of it's like level, kind of level two foundation. What Coach Summer calls foundation two work. Most of the work you'll see in like gymnastic bodies, it's like baby shit. It's what like six year olds do, but when you do it as an adult, it's really fucking hard. There's four levels that go into like learning how to do a mana, a straddle planche, um, rope climbing, all that stuff. So the, the key is to work through all of these levels to get that base strength so that when you go to ring stuff, it makes it easier. And I'm not trying to, like I'm not trying to go into the fucking Olympics or anything, I have no aspirations. I'm too big and I'm too old and I don't have a gift for that. I just like doing it, I think it's fun. I think a lot of the ring stuff, handstand stuff, a lot of the body weight stuff, if you know how to do it right, it's, uh, it's a good one, especially for older people, because um, it does improve mobility, it improves joint strength at all angles, you have a lot of straight arm and bent arm strength work, it prioritizes muscles like brachialis that you don't normally get with, uh, with weightlifting unless you're doing like Zotman's reverse goal, hammer curl, things like that, neutral grip pull-ups and things like that. But I just find it fun, so I, I always, I always eventually come back to this every couple of years. Um, I, I, I improve a couple of progressions. I stop doing it for a while because I get bored. Go back into Olympic weightlifting, or I'll go back into heavy weightlifting, or whatever. But so I've never been able to complete all of the, all of the progressions. So I'm trying this time to do it, and once I get a little better at it, I'll start mixing in some weight training with it as well. But it's fun. This stuff is really fun and I can do it anywhere. I don't actually need any weight. So for a lot of clients, I have a client going to Mexico on holiday. I don't know what type of hotel gym she's going to have. She's been going through some more like powerlifting type stuff. She's gotten really strong. Wanted to start doing more Metcon-y stuff. So we started mixing more like CrossFit-y stuff. Um, and, uh, and now that she's kind of peaked out, it's a good time for her to start doing some body weight training. So I'm going to have her do that over the holidays so that we don't have to worry about what she has available at the gym because her body is going to be the gym. So we'll work on mobility, conditioning. We'll work on some strength skill work stuff, kind of give her a nice deload from that. And we come back, we'll integrate some of that with some of her strength work. So this is a client that had a knee, her knee was all kinds of jacked up. So I rehabbed her knee and now we're working on, she's, I think she's like 130 pounds. She's getting close to a 200 pound deadlift. Uh, she's getting close to 190 pound snatch deadlift. Um, because her knee was jacked up, we focused on that stuff mainly. 
And uh, now that that's really high, her, but her knees feels fantastic, now we're bringing her front squat and back squat up. So front squat's about 135 pounds, so right at about body weight. Back squat's about 155. So my goal was to bring the back squat up to around 200 and bring the front squat up to like, maybe like 180, 185. And I'll be fairly happy with that and we can work on some other stuff. So uh, we're gonna transfer maybe into some more um, things, not like full Olympic lifts, but doing clean pull, snatch pull, stuff that's more fun. And I think part of what people need to think about is that, especially when training gen pop, that want to do cool stuff, it's okay to have fun in your training. And gen pop, when you get them reasonably strong and you start adding things in like snatch pull, hang power snatch, they, they tend to like that a lot. And I think for older people, it's good because it creates a, a good plyometric type of movement that most people don't get. As you get older, some of the things with like losing joint stiffness, which sounds really weird because people go, oh, I, you want loose joints. No, you want mobile joints, but you also want them to be stiff. You want them to be able to stiff in order to keep themselves together and to transfer power from a weight or from the floor to the muscles, to the tendons to then kind of bounce that back. Um, so like if you're running, in order to increase good running economy, you do want to have stiff tendons, you want to have stiff joints, but you want them to be mobile as well. So I know that sounds counterintuitive, but in order to transfer that force every time you hit the ground, you want to make sure you're being able to direct that correctly. You have to store it and redirect it. So it's, it's good for older clients to do more dynamic stuff, more jumping, skipping, hopping, running, um, conditioning in different planes of motion, um, things like that. Because I find that as you get older, strength is really easy to get back, but things like um, rate of force development, power, speed, mobility, flexibility, and especially not just like yoga flexibility, but being strong and flexible, having what we call liquid steel. Muscles will extend and contract, but you can hold strength in those positions. That's really important. And that stuff is really difficult to get later in life. Whereas getting stronger later in life is fairly easy because when you look at using dumbbells and barbells and cables, it's highly scalable. When you're dealing with body weight stuff, it is kind of scalable, but you, you can only be scalable to a certain degree. And if we think about one of the biggest killers of people, a killer of the elderly, or, or is an elderly person having a fall and not being able to stop that fall. So for me, I'm always thinking ahead, like the clients have these initial goals right now that they want to get leaner, they want to get stronger, they want to get their guts in order, they want to get their brains right, all this stuff. But we also need to think about like, what about in 40 years? Like, what, what have you put into your retirement fund? Do you want to be like your grandparents and your parents are all fucking crippled up and shit on 20 medications and haven't used one of those little fucking seated four post roller things? Or do you want to be like a Jack LaLanne and actually be 90 years old and still like swimming and doing pull ups and push ups and being able to actually move? So, um, what I try to do with, with muscle nerds clients is get them to understand that, yeah, strength is good, but movement is also good. And if we sacrifice movement just to jack your strength up more, what's the fucking point? Because then you lose access to positions that, that are probably gonna be pretty important and, um, and also to prevent like injuries and falls and improve your quality of life. So like a squat is great, but how applicable is that to people outside of the gym? Um, lunges, like lunges are probably more important out of the gym than a squat. Deadlift is probably more important than a squat, but they're all important. Um, some are probably more important or they're importanter, but realistically we need to make sure that we have a balanced program and that we're doing things that is gonna enhance the client's life outside of the gym especially if you're training normal gym pop and they have no aspirations of being a competitor or whatever. Um, we wanna make sure that people enjoy their training and we wanna make sure that they're in seeing that value outside of the gym. And that's where I think a lot of coaches lose that, they lose the thought process in that they think that everybody needs to be able to squat three times their body weight. 
or everybody needs to have veins on their abs. But that's not really what most of your gym pop people are asking for. That's just what everybody markets, right? So I think if we can take bits and pieces out of different people's styles of programming, so you have like the power lifters, what is their specialty? Getting really strong in the bench squat and deadlift. Um, getting fat, shaving their heads, and growing a goatee if you're like old school, like early 2000s, late 1990s power lifters. If you look at bodybuilders, what is, what's their whole goal? Like getting as much muscle as possible and then getting as conditioned as possible and then showing it off in their panties. Cool. There's nothing wrong with that. If you look at endurance athletes, what's their whole thing? Running a certain distance in less time. If you look at the movement guys, what is their thing? Being able to play and move and have joint range of motion. Now, if you go to the extremes at any of those things, you're giving something up. So a power lifter is not going to be very mobile because being overly mobile is detrimental to their sport. Uh, a movement guy is going to be strong, but they're not going to have power lifter type strength because that's going to, to get power lifter type strength, they're going to have to get rid of some of the ability to move in the positions they need to do parkour or to do tricking or to do whatever they're doing. So the goal is to take little elements of each and use it when it's necessary to solve your client's problem. So how get strong enough, get mobile enough, get flexible enough, get conditioned enough to be able to enjoy your life outside of the gym and don't put all your fucking eggs in one basket. Yeah, like when I first started and this is the this is what all coaches fall into. It's the same we all we all fall into it, right? Good coaches all fall into it. My way is the best way, my desires are your desires. So I came from a powerlifting, strength and power sport, you know, track and field, powerlifting, weightlifting. Uh, everything I did was aggressive, violent, fast, heavy. So when I, and, and you know, bodybuilding background. So it's like powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding, track and field, American football. So when I got in the industry, everybody that came to see me, I was like, yep, you're a woman, we're going to have you doing a physique show. All she wanted to do was fit into a size 12 pant that she couldn't get into since college. Every guy coming in, uh, I just, I just want to lose some weight and see my dick. I haven't looked down and seen my pecker in like 15 years. Oh, we're going to put you in a strongman contest. That was my thought process. I was so, so overly emphasizing performance that I, I wasn't, I was hearing my clients, but I wasn't listening. And then anything that I was inputting would get jumbled up in my brain and I wasn't doing a good service because I was not giving them what they wanted. I was using things that they didn't need to be doing, things that were too extreme. I wasn't scaling things down. If yeah, 80 year old grandma comes in on her walker and it's fucking squat day and I don't want to do squats. I'd be like, bitch, get in the fucking squat rack. You know, I wasn't doing what was right for the client. I was doing what I thought was right which only lived in my head, it didn't live in there. So there was a mismatch of goals and a mismatch of desires and a mismatch of communication. And so I, I realized later that, okay, I'm, I'm going about this the wrong way. I really need to, what is my client asking me for? Stop giving them the bait and switch. So like, if you, if you won the lottery and you decided like, you're, a Lamborghini was the car or let's say a Ferrari, this is a good one. A Ferrari was the car that you've always wanted. So you're now gonna go buy a Ferrari and you go pay $375,000 for a nice red Ferrari because you grew up seeing uh, a Magnum PI driving a Ferrari Testarossa. So you go buy a brand new Ferrari. You show up and it's an it's a old Pontiac Fiero with, a, with a, uh, a Ferrari body kit. You would not be happy about that, right? That is very similar to what coaches do when their clients go, I just want to lose 10 pounds and fit into a size 12 pants. And then you go, well, okay, we'll do that. And then you're going, oh, man, I'm going to get this bitch to 12% body fat. Like, that is not <laughs> what she's asking you to do. Um, she just wants to feel better about herself and fit into some clothes. And she wants to see the scale go down. Uh, and then you get into this like self-righteous, well, you, what you're saying is you want to lose body fat. You don't actually want to lose weight. We want to lose body fat. No, that bitch said she wants to lose weight. So let's like, 
she does not give a shit about that. Like, you can bring that up later, but right now, she wants to see a pound come off the scale. So it's like, we need to get better at not just hearing what people are saying when they ask for, when they pay us gobs of money to do this. We need to actually do the right thing to get them to the goal they're looking for. And everybody's different. Now, what I do find too is if you like training competitors or whatever you like to train, but most of your people are gym pops, give them time because what I find is that if you can get them a little bit stronger, you get them feeling better, they almost always want more. It's almost like playing a video game. They always want more. So, you know, women still come into the gym and they go, I don't want to lift heavy weights because I don't want to get bulky. Instead of saying, well, that's not physiologically possible because you don't have as much fucking muscle mass and you don't have a testosterone. And if it was that easy, everybody, you don't stop saying that shit. Just say, okay, cool. So we won't do that. Once they start getting stronger and they see other women in the gym that aren't bulky, that are really strong, they're going to notice that. And I'm telling you 10 times out of 10, they're going to go, hey, she's not very big, but she's squatting double her body weight. How is that possible? Now you can have that conversation to go, well, actually lifting doesn't actually make you bulky. It actually gives you shape and uh, it makes you stronger. It makes doing shit outside the gym a lot easier and more fun and cool. Um, but if you come out the door and you go against their, their current belief system, whether it's wrong or right, you're never going to win that battle. So it's better to let them see other people doing cool shit. So we have a couple of people at our gym. Uh, one, of, one of my old online clients, she, I train her husband and I trained her and now she's doing group classes at our gym. She's an absolute fucking animal. She's in the Australian Defense Force. She is fit as fuck. She just did a triathlon. She's in her 50s, did a triathlon, trains like an animal. Probably the strongest woman in our gym. And Zoe was training, like she got in the group classes and all the women are coming up going, Zoe, how is she deadlifting that much? She's like, because she's pushing herself. And that's like, that's what it takes. If you want to get your results, you're going to have to push yourself. You're going to have to go through a bit of discomfort. That's why she's like it. So now it's starting to, it's starting to infect the other women and women who maybe they would not do any more than eight kilos on a movement. They're just naturally grabbing nines or ten. So they're, they're starting to, starting to get into that rhythm of, okay, I'm doing seven kilos for 15 reps, but that's really easy. Maybe I should try the eights. Oh, that's easy too. I'll try the tens. Okay, that feels hard. Now when that feels easy, they're going to go grab the 11s or the 12s. But um, we can't force people to conform to what we think is the right thing. We have to let them come to that decision by themselves, and you get much better progress that way. Ugh. Because I came up in with Poliquin, I basically, when I, was, when I was a student and when I was teaching, basically teaching how to train champions, training how to train Olympians, national world level stuff. So a lot of the stuff we learned there, while it was applicable to Gen Pop, it needed to be scaled. And we never taught how to scale that stuff down. So when I first did my PICP 1 and 2, I went to my gym. And of course, like anybody who learns this stuff, they want to go save the world. So I start doing all this testing that they didn't need, writing the programs they couldn't recover from. To the point where people, my clients started calling me the butcher uh, because I would just annihilate them and I would, I would get joy out of them puking in a workout, hobbling in the next day because they could barely walk. Um, they got, a lot of my clients got to the point where they would throw up in their mouth and then swallow it because they didn't want to give me the pleasure of seeing them puking uh, over the trash can. Or they'd throw up in the parking lot and send me a picture of it. And uh, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't keep an adult client past like three months. They sign it for three months and then they just ghost me. I'd never see them again. I, 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 was, I was the man at training all their kids because like the teenagers and the 20 year olds love that stuff. But the people that actually had money, the people that were in their late 30s and in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they wouldn't last long with me because it was too brutal. And I was like, what is going on here? Something's wrong. And then I realized, man, I'm using stuff that is well past their capacity they might be able to do this in a few years, but I need to figure out how to scale this stuff down and then put the emphasis where it's supposed to go. And the minute I did that, I was on a waiting list. I was one of the top three 
uh, trainers at my gym of over 30 trainers, one of the highest, um, probably the highest or one of gold in revenue for training in all of America. And, uh, and yeah, I, I went from like being at the bottom to, to the top by starting to listen to my clients, to process it, and to give them what they were actually asking for instead of what I thought they should be asking for. Um, and then, then I left and I started, I started teaching for Polycon. And uh, I would ask in every class, I'd say, how many of you, especially PICP, how many of you guys, you had 30 to 60 people in the audience, how many of you guys train athletes? Everybody raise their hand. Okay, how many of you guys train mostly gym pop and maybe one or two athletes? Everybody drops their hand. Or I did that wrong. How many of you, yeah, so like everybody had had their hands up except for a couple people. How many of you guys train mostly athletes and like very little gym pop? There'd be like two guys in the class. I'm like, okay. So then I'd have to start teaching about scalability. Like these are great programs. They're, they're tried. They're true. They work. But they are also coming from a background of athletes, guys in the, like the, like a lot of the programs, Charles was brilliant at this. Like he had a lot of methods he created, but a lot of what he did really well was he took, he was a, he's the one that got me interested in studying physical culture history. He was a fucking computer, an encyclopedia on physical culture history. He could tell you the details of every single method known to man when they used it, why, who created it, you know, everything, how to modify it, all that. And a lot of the programs that he was talking about were guys that were on gear or guys that were athletes or people who were, had gifted genetics. So it's like that's going to work if you're on gear, you got great genetics. But if you're just like Mary Muffin Top or, or Gen Pop George, that stuff was still good, but it needs to be scaled quite a bit. And then I, that's how I learned how to scale it. And then I started teaching that when I left Polican Group and Muscle Nerves, how do we scale this stuff and do what's right and then creating my own methods based on what I learned from Ian King, Charles Poliquin, Paul Check, Charles Staley, uh, Coach Sommer, all these guys, um, all these giants that I stood upon. And, um, yeah, because when we started Muscle Nerves, no one was teaching how to train Gen Pop. They were just like, let's use – programs that were made for genetically gifted people and athletes and people on gear and let's train jump pop that way or they would be training stuff like strict nasm stuff like let's let's fucking do squats on a bosu ball and shit like that and i was like okay there's nothing here in the middle that's like how do we train people with real shit five by five six twelve twenty five gvt gbc like any method you could think of how do we do that with regular normal people that don't have the time and the resources to recover from this, is there a way we can scale this back? And we figured it out. So that we started training gen pop, and now it's kind of a thing. Everybody's training gen pop now because those are the people that need the most help, and that's where most of the money is. But if you want to train athletes, you're telling me you're probably going to be broke all of your life, right? So, and that's the thing. same thing with the stretching is that people, gen pop, you, from a business perspective, you have to give your clientele things that they enjoy. So even if you don't like stretching, I can tell you right now, gym pop people like stretching. Whether you think it does anything or not, it feels good. And what people want when they come to a gym pop gym, especially like our gym, they want two things. They want to be thrashed at some point because it makes them feel better for not being diligent on their diet and being able to splurge a little bit. And they want to feel better after leaving the gym than when they first came in, right? So if we can, you know, give them what we call a happy ending, which is like a brutal Metcon at the end, like they love it. Um, but then we got to give them stuff like stretching. Nobody doesn't like stretching. If you tell me I don't like stretching, stretching doesn't feel good, I'm going to tell you you're a fucking liar. Because you do a nice stretch, it feels nice, right? Regardless of what you think the biological benefit of, the physiological benefit of, no one's going to do a nice stretch like this, like a T-stretch. No one's going to do this and go, that sucked. I don't like it. I'm not doing it anymore, right? You might have people that go, stretching is boring. And if they say stretching is boring, you probably don't know enough about stretching modalities to make it fun. So... 
you can do learn more about different types of stretches and learn how to scale inside and outside like this T stretch. That's a good prerequisite for doing a cactus stretch, which is the next one I'm going to do. This one is really easy to get in a good range of motion. Now, I'm probably more bendy than a lot of lifters, so I've got decent range of motion there. When you bend the elbow, that's going to stop. So you get a good progression doing a T stretch. It feels nice. This one doesn't feel so nice, but it's beneficial to the shoulder, so I do it anyways, especially for the work I'm going to do today. Yeah, so when you're looking at like bang for your buck, okay, we need to think like what, what's the typical, what's a typical day for most gen pops who are paying for training? They're sitting in an office building with almost no movement in the same position. So we need to look at, you know, they're gonna be stiff. So if we don't, if we have limited time, what we need to think about is how do I, how do I program, especially strength, that makes it more economical and gives me flexibility and mobility and strength all in one. So we can classify things as far as like weighted mobility movements. So like a, a, for me, a split squat is a good weighted mobility movement because we move into these big lengthened positions and we add load to that. So instead of squatting for somebody who's sitting in a chair all the time, that they're basically squatting all day. They're just really weak. Instead of that, maybe not prioritize the squat, and maybe prioritize something like a split squat because that's putting them in the ranges they're not used to and that's going to that's going to iron out a lot of wrinkles so like not saying don't squat i'm not saying don't hack squat i'm saying don't leg press but you might look at it as far as maybe we de-emphasize the squat maybe we de-emphasize the leg press and hack squat and maybe we emphasize more the length and range stuff so you might look at Maybe they do squat, but maybe they do three sets of squats, and then they do like four or five sets of split squats. And then on deadlifts, maybe they do a few few top sets of deadlifts, but then they do a lot of hinging. Good morning, seated, good morning, RDL, stuff like that. That's going to get those muscles in that lengthen position that they're not used to being in. Because they're not used to being in lengthen position, they're going to get strength and range of motion gains really quickly, and that's going to create a novel stimulus for hypertrophy because now the muscle is moving into a position where it's under more strain. Um, looking at like bench press versus something like a fly. Bench press versus like a cable press. It's like one of the problems with the bench press is it's basically sandwiching your shoulder blades between your body and the bench. So the, the shoulder blades are gonna have limited movement. Maybe we start, if you, get, if you like the bench, a lot of guys like the bench, I love to bench, but maybe you start thinking about using something like a cambered bar if you have that available. So you can go a little further than what the barbell does. Maybe you emphasize more dumbbells. I will emphasize dumbbells 80 to 90% more than I'm gonna emphasize uh, the bar because at least with the dumbbells, I can move to a neutral position which is a safer position for the shoulder and I can get them to go further in the range so that they create more range of motion in the shoulder. Whereas a bench, you only have a limited amount of position. So you could use a cambered bar if you have that. Like I have a cambered bar here. I use that quite a lot. Um, I use the football bar quite a lot because that football bar allows you to get in like a semi-pronated or neutral position. So that's always going to be a, a, a healthier position at the bottom than being in this position here. Um, and then I'll save the bar for when it's time to do like really heavy strength work and kind of express it if like a straight bar bench press is, is a goal for them. So but I think using cables and dumbbells is a good idea. Using lengthened range of motion movements, save the partial range of motion movements for when it's time for like a strength peaking phase. So I will all, almost always opt for lengthened positions um, or positions that create more range of motion first, and then we'll gradually move into shorter positions and we won't spend a lot of time in those positions. So. Um, when we started Muscle Nerd and started teaching program design, I would, that was kind of the emphasis is most of your clients are only living in the sagittal plane. We need to do more frontal plane and transverse work. That doesn't mean eliminate the sagittal plane stuff. That means use a reductionist policy on that and bring the total, uh, total volume and emphasis down, add back more lengthened range work, try to uh, establish good uh, range of motion under load, which is important, weighted mobility movements. 
Now, fast forward 10 years after starting Muscle Nerd, we get a side benefit of that. Everybody right now, it's one of the hot topics, is the benefit of gaining strength in length and ranges and creating hypertrophy. So that seems to be for a lot of exercises, um, you get increased hypertrophy by training in the length and range. Now, why is that? There's, there's different biological reasons why that may be. But one of the things that I think that I haven't heard anybody talk about is that if you don't have good range of motion and now you get into more range of motion while also loading it, that's a new novel stimulus for hypertrophy. So you could actually grow muscles just by extending the range, even though you're using less weight because your muscle has not been in that position. So your, your muscle has to, it has to mechanically adapt to that new position by creating, putting new links in the chain in that muscle and making the muscle longer. And with part of that, you also get muscle thickening. So I think if, let's say you had three days a week that somebody's gonna train, you have your options for your splits. I would say full body is probably gonna be your best, especially if somebody's brand new. And the reason is, is if you use full body, you could spread the work around the body and spread the volume over the week so they're less likely to get crippling DOMS from that. Now, once they become more, um, they become well-trained or better trained, then full body or moving to an, like an upper lower is probably gonna make the most sense. That w but the problem with the upper lower is if they, if they somehow miss a workout, let's say you have Monday and Friday this week is leg day and Wednesday's chest day, let's say, is, let's say origin is on and you're gonna go to the fucking pub. I don't even know if it's on on Fridays, but let's say it's on the day and they're gonna skip out and go to the pub. You only got one leg day and one chest day that week. Then the next week you might have upper day on Monday and Friday and legs on Wednesday. So you've got this gap. You haven't trained legs Monday to Wednesday. You're gonna get suboptimal results. So if you were using a full body routine, even if they miss a day, it's not the end of the world because they've probably got sufficient volume. So I think for most gen pop, I, my favorite's always gonna be full body workouts. Uh, we use a lot of GBC. We find that people like that. So we'll alternate upper and lower body parts and it ends up being a full body routine that if, even if they miss a day because their kid's sick or something happens, if they hit the other two days, they're still pretty sweet. Um, or we'll use uh, a template of full body where they come in, they do their lower body first, like for the first half of the session, and then we use um, upper body for the last half of the session. And we might do that for a few weeks and we might flip that or we might flip that every week so that um, whatever you train first in a workout is what's going to get the best uh, stimulus because you're not fatigued. So you might have uh, Monday and Friday on week one might be lower first than upper, then Wednesday might be upper first than lower, and then the next week you switch that. So you're always kind of rotating through one workout being lower upper, the next workout being upper lower. But I think if you have limited time, two or three sessions a week, I think full body's the way to go. If you have, if you can come in four days a week, now you've got more options, full body, or you could possibly go to uh, an upper lower. And then when somebody gets more advanced, then you can start splitting things out into like arms and shoulders, legs, um, chest back, or you could go like vertical push pull legs, horizontal push pull. There's a, a million different ways that, uh, that we can write this. And what's nice is we've been working on a software for the last two and a half years. It's programming that's basically going to help coaches program faster um, with uh, not artificial intelligence. I call it artificial intelligence and Zoe gets mad at me, but it takes, we've come up with all these formulas where it takes a lot of biometrics and data plots based and also their goals, their training age and all this, and it funnels down programs that are gonna be specific to the thing that you put in, how much time they have, how many days a week, do you wanna use linear or alternating periodization? Do you wanna use, do you want fat loss, health, endurance? Like what, it's gonna do all the work for you and then all you have to do is pick the exercises. And then the exercise will be classified in a drop down where it's only gonna give you the exercise that are relative to that movement pattern. Uh, I don't know when we're gonna get that out because it's just been a massive financial and time vampire, but hopefully we'll get that out <laughs> for beta testing soon. But it's gonna make it so much faster for coaches to program and also to learn how to program correctly. Um, yeah, because we'll also have education in there. So 
all the templates that come up will have a, initially a write-up that explains like the history, when you would do it, why you wouldn't do it, contraindications. It's going to come up with all that stuff, um, different ways to modify stuff. And then eventually, once it grows, we'll start putting in educational videos as well, not just for the coaches, but also for their clients, so the clients can understand why they're doing something, um, what they need to look out for, when they need to, uh, when you might need to stop that or start that or do something else. So it's it's just the building software is a massive, massive, massive pain in the ass, but we're getting there. Oh, hey, we did a nice rotational trap stretch, oblique stretch. Goal here is trying, trying to turn as much as you can, trying to get your shoulder and your straps to the floor. As you can see, I'm far from it, but we're getting there. Like I said, mobility is no different than anything else. Like you want to take it nice and slow and let your body let your body get there when it wants to um and sometimes you know it's just like strength training you get stuck on a weight let's say you're doing five by five you get stuck on 100 kilos and you kind of slog through two three four sessions it doesn't feel like it's getting better and all of a sudden you go in and and you hit it and it feels easy and you put 105 on the bar and it's like almost effortless so the body is going to adapt at the rates that it wants to so another quote i like is uh, make haste but slowly right so Work on work on hard and get in the positions, but don't be so eager to get uh, to get your uh, your progress super fast. We used to, we have a saying, or we used to have a saying in powerlifting: "Is strength easily gained? Is strength easily lost?" And from what I remember, that mainly came from you know people doing like Dianabol and other steroids or trying to get really big and really fast, strong, and then when they come off of it, shrinking down and losing a lot of that strength that they built up. So um, it is realistically more, should be more of the tortoise than the hare. There are times where you can speed stuff up um, and use really specialized training, especially when you get really advanced. So like this year, like I haven't really bench pressed in two years and because I've been doing the cycling and the running and and some other stuff I've hardly lifted weights in the last couple of years really um, but I got on this big kick for a while for Olympic lifting so I was working on improving my snatch and my clean did that for a long time never really touched any type of pressing except for overhead uh, in January I decided ah, I'll see my birthday's on February 25th I'll see I'll see what I can bench press on my birthday so Jan early January I was like 120 kilos was hard. Like that was a struggle to bench. So I decided in order to speed this up, I would do mainly weight releasers and just focus on the eccentrics. And so I kind of set a goal. Okay, what's reasonable? I'll hit 130 by my birthday. I've got eight weeks. I hit 130 in like two weeks. It's like, all right, I'll go 135. I hit 135 in like another two weeks. I'm like, okay. I go to 140. I hit 140 in like another three weeks. I'm like, shit. So then I ended up on my birthday benching 143 at like 92 or 94 kilos of body weight, which is like that's for the general population. They would see that as, wow, it's really strong. Like to me, that's not that strong just because of the the sport of powerlifting and all that. But um, but it's not bad. Putting almost 50 pounds on your bench press in six to eight weeks is, is, is pretty, pretty fucking good. But I use um, – extreme ways of getting there that is not going to be sustainable right so that's why now after doing that now i'm doing this to try to clean up some mobility stuff and then once i start getting used to the gymnastics training i think another one more week of it and i've been doing it for about four weeks at that point i can look at the stuff i'm doing and say okay what is what needs to stay and what can be removed and then i'll remove some of the stuff that i don't need and i'll replace that with um, with more traditional strength work, right? And one of my goals right now is to get back to doing like heavy uh, single leg squats, heavy pistols. And the reason is because I've got a massive strength discrepancy between my right and left leg. And so when I'm squatting, I can feel myself squatting mainly on the left leg. And uh, I had a horrible back injury at the end of 2019 that I had to rehab spent a ton of money and a ton of, ton of time and research fixing my back. In 2020, my back was constantly out and I was constantly trying to fix it. By 
2022, it would go out once every few months. And it's mainly what I sit at my desk all day doing work, um, stand up super stiff. So now 2024, basically between 2022 and 2024, it, it goes out maybe once a year and only when I do something epically stupid. So like after I did the 143 bench, uh, like I said, I'm a close grip bencher, which is, is good because you're in a good position to produce power, but I, ha I have long arms, so I have to move the bar really far. So it's like, okay, I haven't done a wide grip, like super wide grip bench in like 10 years. And last time I was with Sebastian Orb hanging out with him, he said, yeah, you need to be like bench wider, get wider. And I was like, I can't because it just destroys my shoulders. And uh, he's like, well, you just got to like deload everything and work your way back up. And I'm like, okay. So once I hit the 143, I said, okay, if I can get comfortable here where it doesn't hurt my shoulders, then that's going to reduce the distance I have to move the bar like six to eight inches. So I just have to get comfortable. So this gymnastics work is one of the easiest ways for me to get comfortable in this position. The problem is I didn't set up right. I got lazy and uh, I did a set. I was too far from the rack. So I'm in this massively extended position. I went to put the bar down, and once I went here, my lats locked up to try to prevent it from going back, and it popped my lower back. So, um, you, you, John, you saw me, was it last weekend? Uh, hobbling around. So, like, hobbling around, and then I was training someone, and I was helping them, assisting them on a hack squat, and I pulled, and it popped on the other side. So, I've been damn near crippled now for about a week and a half. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Right, so I get back into it. So I've I've omitted the bench, just because I don't want to get in this position where I'm overly extended and trying to rack that bar up. So now when the back, when I feel confident, I'll add that back in and start slowly working up that bench, and I'll be more diligent about getting set up in the right position. Okay, so now that extended set is supposed to take 25 minutes, but because we're talking, it's taken a long time. So today I'm going to do some basic ring work um, with the system that Coach Somers laid out. You can't really do the ring work until you've gotten through most of the foundation stuff. However, you can um, you can play around with it. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to get like a lot of the stuff that's a pain in the ass done, like learning how to get into a false grip. When you get into a false grip, it's not the most enjoyable thing in the world. So you're basically your wrist is at a 90 degree angle and you're holding like that, right? So you need a tremendous amount of forearm strength for this and you need a tremendous amount of range of motion. So you'll get people who can't flex to 90 degrees. You have to eliminate, you have to get that before you can even do a false grip. My problem now is I can do a bent elbow false grip but I can't do a straight arm so I don't have the uh, forearm strength for this yet. So I'll be doing uh, false grip lockouts and I'll also be doing like bent hangs and just trying to get my forearms beefy. And what I like about this is when you look at gymnasts, the gymnasts that have the biggest biceps, like stupidly big for guys that aren't massive, they do a lot of bent arm and a lot of straight arm work. So what we'll be doing is our bent arm work will be doing the false grip lock offs, uh, bent arm, and then our straight arm work will be doing more ring plank stuff uh, because you need a really strong core to be able to do a lot of these skills. So. I'm just doing like the baby stuff from the rings and I'm not gonna progress past that until I get my other core skill work up, okay? So um, the first thing is we'll, we'll start with um, some like hangs and things like that to try to create some space in the joint. So nice double arm hang. When you're doing the double arm hang, what you wanna do is try to drive your shoulders up towards your ears. So if you think about doing a handstand, if you wanna lock in a good handstand, you have to basically shrug your body up. You want to you want to elevate the shoulder blades. Okay, so it's the same principle here. I'm elevating the shoulder blades and trying to stretch my upper back and my shoulders as much as possible. Um, now, if you're dealing with somebody who has hypermobility, I would tell you this is a no-no. You really wouldn't want to do this because with somebody who already has joints that are overly tractioned out, this would be a nightmare. Okay, but if somebody has especially really bad range of motion in the shoulders. Getting more traction is a good thing because people can get, when they have joint issues, they can have a lot of compression where the bone is being sucked into the joint. Now, to move a joint, 
you also have to have compression. So in order to bring my arms this way, going into shoulder abduction, I need to be able to pull the head of the humerus into the joint and then flip it around and stabilize it. If somebody's already overly compressed, the minute they raise that up, there's no room for more compression because they're already overly compressed. So if you can get your arms overhead, that's a good one to do. If not, you could use rings and go from a smaller, uh, lower position and lean back. So take rings, lean back, and then eventually you can keep working that overhead until you can get into full shoulder flexion. Okay, so we'll do, we do the double arm hang, now single arm hangs, which I couldn't do this a few weeks ago. This is definitely, this is definitely a big no-no too when I was 115 kilos. Now that I'm 94, this is pretty easy. So if you find hangs, if you find hangs difficult, lose weight. So um, double arm will help with single arm, but so the first thing is getting a, a good solid double arm hang. Well, the first thing is getting into the range of motion because again, like with a lot of the coaches that we train and a lot of the gym pops, that the minute they move their arm into shoulder flexion, they get impinged, which tells me something's not working right. There's a, there's a uh, miscommunication or imbalance between the superficial muscles that most people train and the muscles that are actually holding the joint together. So most people will focus on chest, shoulders, back. They focus on hypertrophy. They focus on building these muscles that are superficial because they want to look better. But what we need to understand too is those, those are prime movers. Those aren't stabilizers. So there are muscles that are attaching and keeping the bones together and keeping the joint stability. If your prime movers get really strong and they get way more strong than those stabilizers can handle, the stabilizers are gonna try to pass off some of their task to the prime movers, and then the joint doesn't work correctly. So sometimes it's A, mobility flexibility work to kind of ease some of that off, and then also working directly in on the muscles on the joint. So like external rotation, internal rotation, doing things that work in the supraspinatus, the muscle that comes across here that attaches the top of the scapula to the humerus, getting all those things to, to work together nicely because if they're constantly, if you think about like they're like a family and they keep fighting each other, um, the more they fight, the more shit's gonna hit the fan. So we wanna make sure that all of, those, uh, all of those muscles are doing their task and doing their job. So it's like, uh, I was a big fan of the Patriots uh, you can call me a, like a bandwagon guy or whatever, I don't care. I didn't really have a, a football team because I hated the Cowboys um, after the Emmitt Smith, Troy Aikman, and all those guys left. Um, so I didn't, really have, I, I didn't really have a football team. I had a basketball team, which are the Spurs. The reason I like the Spurs is because they don't have, they don't have a lot of showboating guys. Like Pop trained, the, he basically they play like, but good fundamental technical basketball. They run plays and they all play together really well. They don't have a LeBron James, they don't have a Michael Jordan. So they all just play really well together. So that's the type of teamwork that I like. A team sport should have teamwork. So when I moved to New England, I fell in love with the Patriots because they were the same way. Yeah, of course you had Tom Brady. Like you had those guys, but the team played well together, right? They didn't try to, one person didn't try to be the, the all-star. So I really like that. So. Their hashtag at the time was hashtag do your job. So if everybody does their job, they win championships. So that's the hashtag I think about with like joints and your suspension system for the body. If everybody does their job, everything is good. If one person tries to showboat and tries to do too much, that's where you start getting into trouble, right? And I came up with this, uh, Tom Myers, I did a, a, a cadaver course with him and a lot of the stuff he said to me like really, really sunk in and made me change and cutting dead people open open and really seeing like how different muscles are oriented and attachment points and all that it, it really sh like changes your mindset about how the body works one thing he said is that uh, when you look at how everything's connected and uh, and how if you pull you could pull on a muscle he pulled on a muscle that was deep in the hip and I could see the toes moving like it was everything's connected so and you can really only do that with a course like his where they're fresh cadavers they're they they're basically just frozen dead bodies there, there's no formaldehyde once you formaldehyde it you lose a lot of that because it plasticizes everything but um, he said are, are are we do we have 600 muscles or is it one muscle in 600 compartments 
And once I started thinking about that, I was like, you know, he's right. And I started thinking about, like, if you look at muscles and how they're oriented, look at something like your subscat, which is lining the inside of your scapula. It's attaching here. And you look at your infraspinatus, or infraspinatus, which is on the back side of your scapula and attaches here. They both, they're the same, roughly the same shape, and they both move the same direction. The only thing that's preventing those two muscles from being the same muscle is a bony piece between their attachments. And now they have opposing forces, they're antagonistic muscles. So um, he said something to us that was like, if you look at, if you look at different muscles and the way they orient, we could kind of in a weird way say that two muscles are actually the same muscle. They just have two opposite actions, right? And two opposite jobs. But then the way I teach this is something like this. Like if this is your upper arm and this is your subscap and this is your infraspinatus, if we put a nail here and then we pulled on one, we see that the humerus rolls one way. So one side has to pull while the other one has to follow it. If you pull with the other one, the other one has to follow it. Now, if one of them is pulling and the other one doesn't want to extend or if it's already extended past what it can do, now the humerus can't move. So we need to start thinking about muscles and bones in that manner and not just thinking about your butt, your glutes, stop thinking about your, your pecs, your shoulders, Start thinking about the muscles that are in there that you can't see. Most people won't train that because a lot of trainers don't even know those muscles exist and they don't know how to train them. And they're too busy trying to get big and strong with those big prime movers because that's what you can see. They can't, you can't show a, it's very difficult to show a before and after uh, somebody that's improved range of motion in a joint and has no pain. That's not really sexy for, uh, for Instagram, right? So it's like, People want to see half-naked bodies of somebody who is like overly fat and then somebody who's like peeled it off and gotten lean. P sex sells, right? That's the visual effect that it sells. If I posted somebody's blood work and showed how we improved all their markers, that wouldn't resonate with anybody except maybe doctors. But if I showed like how, if I showed a testimonial of somebody not being in pain anymore and showed improved range of motion and strength, no one would give a shit. But that stuff's really important. So like something like this, where I'm holding on to the bar and I'm rotating into this, I'm getting more pronation and supination of my forearm. I'm also stretching out the rotator cuff as well. Um, so a lot of this work, like doing the double hangs and then going to a single hang, you can go on a single hang assisted where you use your feet to just let you have just enough tension and eventually you can remove your feet. This as well, if I'm dropping into this, I'm getting that strengthening, which is realistically my hand. The hand is what's going to prevent you from doing a hang. It's not the muscles of the back. It's can I hold the grip? Because the minute so if somebody doesn't have a good grip, the minute they remove their hand, they let go of the, the bar. So hand strength is incredibly important for this. This is definitely not one you jump into, don't go zero to 100 in three seconds. You wanna rotate, and then once you feel the tension, stop there, don't push it, because it will open up over time. You just have to convince your brain that you're not in danger in that position. Let's see, where are we at on here? Yeah, let's get shrugs, I've got shrugs. And everything's to full range of motion. Deep hang. Now shrug, depress, retract as high as I can. And back down. All right, now the German hangs, the assisted German hangs. Okay, so... German hangs are one of my favorite. I'm not going to do the full hang. What I'm doing is just going to be kind of a modified assisted because I'm working on a bit of strength endurance in the position of being in deep shoulder extension, which a lot of people don't have very good shoulder extension. 
A lot of people won't do a German hang because something I learned from Mike Fitch, who, um, who's the creator of Animal Flow, a lot of adults, the reason they have a hard time doing stuff like this, like inverting, they get really scared because when's the last time you've been upside down, like purposely? It's been a long time. So trying to teach people handstands and headstands, it can be hard for people because they have a fear of falling on their head or they have a f it feels weird to be upside down. So normally in a German hang, I would hang from this, I'd flip around in this position. But this is a good one to get in the same position without doing that. Also, especially if you don't have good shoulder extension, if you don't have good shoulder extension, you don't want to be flipping over in this until you get that and establish some strength. So what we can do is we can just bring these around to the back. Now I can move into that deep hang position. So this would be a good one for people who are just getting into this, but obviously like a lot of people aren't going to be able to get into this position unless you have good mobility of the motion. But you can start here and just lean into it. And now I'm getting a tremendous stretch across my chest across my shoulders, right? And really reinforce the ability of getting my hands behind my back and getting extended as much as possible. A good amount of shoulder extension should be about 60 degrees. I've seen coaches come in that have five to 10 degrees and they wonder why their shoulders are so fucked up and they wonder why their back's not growing. They can get into this position, but when they row, like that's all they have. If we can get them here, and get them really back here, we can dig into a lot more muscle, right? Now, later I'll be hanging from these, but since this is just the warm-up portion, we'll be doing that. So you see, like this is, this is not, it's not easy work. Nothing I'm doing here is easy. So if people say that stretching is easy, um, yeah, try some of this stuff because this is definitely not easy and, and you will have crazy doms after it my uh, my coach max who lives with us he's been getting into some of the stretching with me and like we did uh, a front split series and, a, and a, a middle split series he's like my fucking hamstrings have been completely destroyed for like four or five days right so you will get a lot of doms at first but it will go away as you as you get into deeper positions get used to it now the last one we're going to do of this and then we've got some like banded warm-up stuff we do um, and then we get, we get into the shit that sucks. Like the, the false grip lock-offs are the worst thing today. After that, everything's pretty cruisy. But, and it's only bad because it's fucking painful. But what now we're going to do, what we do, lat flies. So we're going to pull ourselves here and then basically try to move forward and backwards. Yeah, what I would tell you to do is just keep your feet on the floor, right? So like put a box and then come up and just start working here. And when that gets okay, you can start to bend the knees and then start to bring your feet up over time, right? But like a lot of this stuff is, again, it's more advanced, some of the stuff I'm doing. So there's even stuff in um, the stretch series that I don't do. Like it's just, it's way outside of my scope of being able to do right now. Um, and I'll look at that, it's like, okay, I'll do that later. I'll just work on what I can work on, right? And like I said, with this stuff, with the rings, um, it's recommended that you have a fairly good fund foundational strength and foundational range of motion. Um, so some of this stuff here that I've done with German Hangs, like you wouldn't see beginners doing. But this stuff I like, which is um, some of the kind of banded, some of the banded um, like warm up, uh, activation stuff, you call it, whatever. I don't have the right band. This is way more band tension than you would use for this. But basically, again, working on those muscles inside of the joint, not necessarily the outside, and getting them conditioned because you get into certain positions, if those muscles fuck out, A, you can't hold the position, you're probably going to hurt yourself. A lot of people poo-poo bands, but... You know, this isn't the only thing I'm doing. There's nothing wrong with bands. Yeah, I'll be like, oh, it doesn't match the strength profile. So fucking what? I'm still getting tension where I want it. And it's easy where I want it. And this is all just like activation stuff, moving through a bunch of different positions. Let's see. So 
take to goal. I've got to go. I've got to order some bands. Especially, I'm going to start adding a lot more band of powerlifting work. I've got to order some bench press bands. I've got a lot of clients that are, got some clients in powerlifting meets and clients who are using weight releasers now and bands and chains. So, what I tend to do is when I'm using stuff with other clients, I'll also train that way as well because it's been a long time since I've used bands and chains. So if I'm going to give a, someone a protocol, I need to make sure that I remember how it feels. So um, just another reason why I started doing the weight releasers this year for the first couple of months because I have two or three clients using them. So I'm like, okay, I need to do similar protocols to what they're doing because I, since I haven't used them in a long time, I need to remember how crippling they can be and make sure that what I'm doing with my clients, they can actually do. And we're not going to run into a, an issue where they, uh, where they're like massive doms for 10 days and can't train. Well, it's because they know they, people train people the way they train because that's what they're comfortable, but that might also be the only way they know how to train, right? So like I have friends who specialize only in power lifters and they know very little about the stuff I'm doing. They know, they know enough about bodybuilding. They know how to build muscle, but like you wouldn't hire them for a bodybuilding show, right? Um, but what they do is really good work and they know they know their lane and they stay in their lane, right? You want to get built it. You want to get fucking strong. I'm your guy. Or you want to get on a bodybuilding stage. That's your guy, right? You want to run an ultra. That's your guy, right? Now, I don't have a specific niche because I've spent the last 30 years doing endurance, gymnastic work, calisthenics work. I'm like the, I'm like the, the crossfit of coaches. Like I know, I know all these different systems, right? I've competed in grappling. I've, cre I've competed in mixed martial arts. I've done all of this stuff, right? So um, even if I get a client, I get a client coming in and they say, I want to do this thing. Okay. Do I actually have experience in that? Okay. Yes or no. If I'm like, I do, but I don't have as much as I probably should for this person. The first thing I'm going to do, I have enough to coach them, but I'm going to go and do a consultation or a mentorship with someone who's an expert at that and learn really quickly that way because that's the best, fastest way to learn is by shadowing people and doing uh, mentorships with people. So I still spend gobs of money on, uh, on my own education. I think last year we spent like 30 grand, Gene and Zoe, and on our education. So, and I've done that since I was 21, 22 the same thing. I spent most of my 20s and early 30s broke as shit because any money I had, I just, I went to, went into education, right? So now I'm confident that unless you're into something weird, like if you're a dragon boat racer, I can probably write that. I'm not going to be the best person. So I'm going to make a decision on either referring that out or I'm going to call the best person and pay them for their time and let them like help me because the only thing you need to know about that is you need to know the demands of the sport. If you know the demands of the sport and you know what you need to test and you know, you know key indicator lifts, you can train that sport at least from a strength and conditioning aspect, um, maybe not a technique uh, aspect. So, well, I think the, the big thing is you have to have a, a, really solid, a really solid understanding of biochemistry, not like – you don't need to, you need to understand at least, like, to me, first, second semester biochem. Because that's going to be the foundation for both nutrition and for exercise metabolism. Then you also need to know, uh, have a good knowledge base of biology and physiology. And, and, and also, like, applied anatomy or, or, uh, or functional anatomy as well. Because a lot of guys know decent enough gross anatomy but they don't understand what happens to your anatomy when your joint's in a different position. So like, for example, what my piriformis is doing here is completely different than what it's doing here. So you got to know that, right? 
um, what my supraspinatus is doing here is different when I get to here. So if you don't know that stuff, it's going to be, you could, you could fake it, but they're not going uh, to get the best results and the safest results. Oh, these suck. Well, part of it's just not get a good, getting a good service to your client. Basically, it's a bait and switch, right? You promise that you can do things and you understand it, but you actually don't, right? So like, um, to give you an example, a uh, friend of mine, Brad Davidson, he's, uh, he's doing like motivational speaking and leadership stuff and all that now. But uh, he, when he was first coaching, he coached a lot of like minor league and ma major league baseball players. Now, I played baseball. I know baseball, right? But every position's different, right? Um, so when I was still training in Texas, we had a lot of guys who were uh, university prospects and even going to be like major or minor league prospects. And I, for some reason, ended up with like a half a dozen guys. And like a few of them were pitchers. They were 15 years old, already had started like the symptoms of Tommy John. Um, their parents wanted them to train with me only for some reason. I said, okay. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what's like, I have no fucking clue, right? I know, I mean, I know enough, but I don't, I'm not as comfortable as I should be. So I called him and I said, okay, what test do I need to run? And then how do I interpret that? And then what do I need to program? So he helped me out. Years later, um, two of the women that were on Biggest Loser decided they didn't want to train at the ranch anymore and, and went to him. So they basically made, he had an upstairs, it was like their lounge kitchen area, they turned it into a, a, an apartment, and the girls lived there and trained. And he called me and he said, hey, it's time for you to pay back that favor. I have two girls from the Biggest Loser, like physique stuff and, and, and rapid fat loss isn't my thing, it's your thing, what do I do? So I helped them through that process, right? So, you know, but it, you, you know, you have to have, you have to have the wherewithal to put your ego to the side and, and, and admit when you have a gap in what you're doing and then seek out the person that can actually help you with that, with that thing. And we got to a, this is a normal thing back in the day. Like back when I was in my 20s, we would all like, we would all go to seminars together. We would call each other, you going to the seminar? Let's all stay together. We'd hang out, we'd party, we'd, we'd trade knowledge, built awesome friendships that way. And we see that with our muscle nerd coaches but I don't see that at any other seminar. If I go to a live seminar, no, nobody's talking about it, except if I go to uh, Stretch to Win for a fascia stretch therapy course, a lot, of, a lot of people will. You still see that community, but I don't see that community anywhere else. Like everybody stays by themselves, they don't talk, they don't network. Whereas that was a massive thing in Politan Group, especially like, like pre, say 2013 or so. Like it was just a big, it was like a big brother sisterhood type of thing, it was great. Now everybody thinks they have all the answers and they're trying to protect their secrets and no one wants to talk and all that. It's, it's ridiculous. So that's what we've tried to do with Muscle Nerds, build, rebuild that community where we've got over 550 coaches in our program design. If you have a question on that forum, there's somebody on there who can answer and there's probably two dozen people who can or can help, not just myself or, or my staff. So it's, it's been this great, like a great think tank for that type of stuff. I've never experienced worse DOMS than the stuff I'm doing today with this bent arm stuff and then going to the straight arm. The first session I did with this, I wasn't even hanging. I've gotten to the point where I can hang now. But the first session I was doing it, like I told you, when, like trying to modify this and keep your feet on the ground and just getting used to having the pain. But uh, I did that in the straight arm plank shit and the next day I, I couldn't even fucking wash my hair. I, couldn't, I could not bend my elbows. I was in so much fucking pain. But now it's gone away. I can do it now. Because I do like to, I like the way um, Coach Sommer sets up his, the way he periodizes stuff. So you do it in, you have three different brackets. So like low skill level work, we'll have a higher time under tension or higher rep range. Um, and then as the skills develop and they get in the harder positions, the time domain and the reps will go down. So something like this, which is a low level skill, the first thing you do is like build up the endurance and the tolerance to hold it. So you start at like say three sets of six, then if you can hold that position for three sets, of, you go to four sets of six, and then you might go to five sets of six, and then three sets of 12, 
So you slowly let the body accommodate to it until you can hit, say, five sets of 60 seconds. Now, if you go a few, you go to the next one, which is a, a straight arm pulse grip, that demand is massively higher. So you, the goal is to work out the five sets of 30 seconds. So he's done a really, really good way of kind of periodizing that. I also like it too. This is not something I've ever talked to him about, but when I'm using this stuff, because I'll use some of this stuff with my clients where they'll do mixed modality, they'll do the bench pressing and all that, but we might do something as an accessory movement that comes out of like basic calisthenic stuff. So let's say um, one of my clients might be doing a five by five or a three, two, one on their A set for bench. Their B set, we might have them doing push-ups for a few sets of say eight to 12. And then they might be do something like an incline push-up or torso elevated push-up and the goal is to work up to three by 15 and then lower the incline, right? And then it makes a nice smooth transfer because if they do, maybe they hit their um, push-up and they can do the standard, maybe they can hit 15 solid reps there for a few sets, or if maybe they do the incline and then the incline turns into the, the push-up and then we do a next higher skill level thing. So they might be starting to do dips at that time. So we can rotate through kind of low skill work for hypertrophy or strength endurance, um, time and retention, but we can still keep a big main movement that provides most of your strength goals in like a traditional movement, like a squat bench or deadlift. So it makes a nice tier system and nice and flexible. And then you also have the, uh, you can also throw in other traditional strength work in it as well. But yeah, because I said earlier, there's a lot of traditional stuff. Um, a lot of traditional weight training will put the body in a more natural position, right? Nothing wrong with that, right? So like, especially you can get in a really unnatural positions when you're trying to mechanically squeeze out more strength, right? So like, let's say you're doing a normal bench press, like a flat back bench press. It's not a great position to bench strong. Great position is bench strong, retract, get a big arch, and find a width that allows you to maintain power, but also reduces the stroke. So you kind of, you put the body in an artificial, unnatural position, not something it's really designed to do, but it's cool and you can get real fucking strong and it's impressive. But it's always good to utilize some type of accessory supplementary movement that allows the body to train in the way it's designed to do. So like a push up is a great example of that because now my scapula, my shoulders can move the way they're supposed to move, right? Or like doing, um, doing something like heavy rows and then doing TRX or ring rows, something like that, right? Anything that then allows you to get a lot more, more s might be maximal for you for that exercise, but stuff that's a bit more controllable, that's a bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like more like of a, a closed chain movement that allows the joints to articulate in the manner that they were originally designed to do, right? Because there's nothing with traditional strength training, there's nothing we do other than maybe like pull-ups and chin-ups. There's nothing you're really doing with that that's normal or natural. Like getting into a deadlift position to lift the most amount of weight possible is not a position you would get in if you needed to pick a big ass rock up off the ground. You know, squatting, snatching, cleaning, none of those put your body in a normal natural position. Uh, again, there's n eh, I don't want people to think that I'm saying you shouldn't do it because we should, but just understand that the more you do that stuff and the less you allow your body to move in the way it's supposed to, the more issues, the poten more potential issues you're gonna have later that you're probably going to want to iron out anyways. So you might as well keep some of that stuff in, right? But it's hard to get people to, it's hard to get meatheads to buy into this stuff because they look at a TRX row and they go, oh, that's too easy. All right, let's put your feet on a box and turn it into a Bulgarian row and try to do this. And then they can't do more than a couple of reps and like, oh, fuck this. I'm going to go back to the cable machine. That's fine too, because at least the cable machine allows you to move like you're supposed to. Or if somebody won't do a bench press, put them in a cable machine and just have them do cable presses, right? Because at least you're doing something that allows the scapula to move, um, especially if you're doing movements that set bones into certain positions and doesn't give them the freedom to move in the way they're supposed to, right? 
Um, just like that the old body builder mentality of like doing pull downs and keeping your scapula where they are. We know that's not how the scapula works. They're forcing their body into that position. Eventually you're gonna run into some problems. So you're doing pull downs, letting it come up, come down. You know, pushing all the way overhead, coming down, right? Pull ups allow you to do that. But um, if you're going to train the body unnaturally, you're probably gonna wanna do some damage control movements in order to prevent or delay any type of long-term compensation and issue that may not manifest now, but a lot of that's like a, a credit card. You build up interest until you can't pay the interest back. And what the, the repo man comes and he takes away your ability to move. And then you have to pay that back slowly. Maybe you can't pay it back and a, 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 a credit company has bought your debt and now you have to pay that person back you're gonna have to pay it back eventually or you're just gonna live a life being completely fucking crippled, right? I mean, how many, how many people in their late 40s, early 50s move well? And it doesn't get any better because they don't, they don't do what they need to be doing to get better. And you see a lot of the guys that people, a lot of the really strong old dudes, people are like, oh, this guy's so strong. When you meet them in person, you see how they walk and how hard it is for them to get on and off a chair. They're real fucking strong in basic traditional movements, but they can't do anything else. Or they end up having like double hip surgery because all they've done was squat and they've squatted in a way that's, uh, that's productive for lifting the most amount of weight, but not exactly productive for keeping your joints nice and happy. And uh, again, I, th I think a lot of it's in, a lot of it's an ego, and a lot of it's a, an identity issue. People are praised for what they're doing. If you look at yoga, people in yoga will praise contortionists for being able to suck their own dicks or eat their own vaginas. But that's not necessarily a healthy amount of mobility. People go, oh man, this guy can squat 650 pounds. And you look at it, you're like, he's lifting that, but that's not really a squat. It's kind of this weird hinge, deadlifty squat thing with a bar on his back. And they go, yeah, but he's still, he's strong. I'm like, yeah, no doubt the guy's strong, but he loves the gym and he's hating life everywhere else. Right? I was just at a conference where I saw one of those guys. It's a guy, I got a lot of respect for him. He's a fucking animal, but I can see you can tell when somebody's moving with pain. Like they can mask it all they want, but you can see how they hobble around and how they, they try to hide it. Um, and you can, always, you can make predictions on that. This guy's not gonna be having a really good time in a few years. Like they can't keep it up forever. I had a friend when I was in my 20s. I don't know, uh, he may be dead now, I don't know especially with the, one of the conversations we had, he had told an elite in powerlifting in three different categories, which is fucking astronomical. And he was going for like, one in total elite in like four or five different categories, which is stupid. Um, he was taking so much gear. He was so unhealthy. And I had a conversation with him once. I go, dude, like, you're gonna fucking die early. You're not gonna live very long. He goes, that's fine, I'll die with all these accomplishments and they'll bury me in a big fucking casket. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand is you and maybe your mom are the only two people who fucking care about that. Like, you're gonna regret this. And after seeing that, and again, like Charles, Charles was injured a lot. A lot of friends in powerlifting and bodybuilding injured a lot. Um, my dad had to have back surgery because he had, he was a mechanic and he had pain in the lower back, sciatica. He would never go get it taken care of. Dealt with that with 18 years, and by the time he actually did something, the only option he had then was, was uh, surgery. And after seeing that, and all my friends being crippled in their 30s and 40s, I'm like, nah, it's not fucking worth it to me. Like, because like, when I think about all the powerlifting meets I won, any trophies, medals I got for placing in a bodybuilding show, or whatever I did, 
Like, if I think about it, that was great. It was, it's like, it's like doing cocaine. It feels good at the time. But then you got to wake up the next day, and you're feeling like a, like a bag of shit, right? So the same thing with competition. Like, it feels awesome at the time, but then are you going to regret that when you're older and be like, oh, look what I, I used to be, a fucking beast. Yeah, but now you're fucking crippled. Like, and that's okay if that's what you want. I never wanted that for myself, and I don't want that for my clients. So that's not something that – that's not something I promote, which is why – our tagline for muscle nerds when we first started was health over performance. Because if you get healthy, performance will naturally follow, right? But if you're overly focused on performance, um, again, you got to give something up. So you got to rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. If you're going performance, 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 any competition, all competitions are unhealthy, right? If you want to win, like if you want to win a bodybuilding show these days, you have to go to a massively unhealthy uh, level of leanness, and uh, you have to do massively unhealthy things to get there. Like, there's just no way to win a bodybuilding show these days, right? So, like, when I was doing bodybuilding or men's bikini, the bodybuilders at that time still had a little bit of ass fat. You didn't see, like, people with cat butt, where you could see their butthole even when they weren't spreading their cheeks. I learned that one from Eric Kilm. But... Like nowadays, if you don't get to that level of leanness, um, you, you're not going to place. It's going to be impossible unless you go to a shitty show. Maybe you're the best-looking physique out of three shitty physiques, and you may, right? But, um, and I guess like the natural bodybuilders are definitely the healthiest, even though it's still unhealthy, the, the levels of leanness they get to. But you see the stuff that bodybuilders, like enhanced bodybuilders are doing now, it's fucking ridiculous, and it has been for a long time, the amount of shit they're on you wouldn't be able to win. The thing is, like, it, there's no competition, at least physical competition, that's not going to be unhealthy. So, and you got to think that unhealthy is a lot of different things. How many, you know, you look at pro athletes, how many football players, American football, had constant concussions, 15 concussions, right? Destroying the brain health. Um, if you look at, combat sports you know how many guys how many guys in the ufc end up breaking their sh their tibia or their femur on a kick how many of them you know look at the weight cuts how many of them collapse to go to the hospital because they've taken that weight cut too far um look at boxing how many people look, you know look at muhammad ali these guys like none of that is going to be healthy because at high levels of performance if you don't have a if you don't have a performance over everything attitude, you're not going to be a fucking champion. Doesn't matter what it is. You, even people, in, even if you look at like top level chess players are on drugs. Like every competition, where there's money, there's drugs. That's what Charles used to say. Hey, don't don't kid yourself thinking that Olympic athletes aren't on drugs. You know what what they tell me and what they told him behind behind closed doors when they trust you is a massively different thing than what they say in public. Um, but if you, if you were to compete without drugs, you're going into a, a gunfight with a knife. It's stupid. Like, and I'm, I'm actually pro-drug. I, I think that people should be, ta be able to, they should have access to foreign enhancing drugs. They shouldn't have to keep it hidden. They shouldn't have to be, they should be tested, but they should also have the access to do it under a doctor's supervision and make it a level playing field in that aspect because if you look at how they can't, they can't play forever. And if doing peptides and doing anabolics extended their career, why wouldn't we let them do it as long as we could keep control over it and make it a standard? Because if you look at American football and you look at videos or pictures of the guys in their 50s, they were nothing like the guys now. Now, nowadays we have bigger gene pool, we have better training techniques, but we also have drugs. Um, so no one's, no one's ever going to go. Let's go back to the 1950s. Those guys, 100, uh, 200 pound guys playing foot. No one's going to want that. They want to see these monsters, but those monsters are basically giving away 
their longevity and their health for the people watching and for gob, gobs of money. And what kills me is they have no problem prescribing them heaps of corticosteroids, reduce inflammation. They don't have a problem giving them heaps of painkillers. But if we go, hey, let's let everybody take testosterone, growth hormone, peptides, whatever, because that's probably a healthier thing to do than what they're doing now, it, it would allow them to play longer with a lot less, a lot less repercussion. That's you know, not really a popular opinion, but they're already taking the shit anyways. Let's just standardize it. I had a friend of mine that played, I have a few friends that played NFL. One of them walked in, he was only 26, 26, 27 at the time. Um, cannot remember what team he played on, but he was like all-star guy, right? He comes hobbling into the gym, just looks like he's in massive pain. I'm like, how the fuck, how the fuck are you able to go out and play with that type of pain? He goes, tons of painkillers. He goes, I'm so doped up when I play, and so is everybody else. We, have, we almost have no idea what the fuck is going on. I go, how do you play like that? He goes, instinct. It's like, we've just been doing it so long, it becomes automatic. He goes, but like, if you're not playing, you're pretty much functionally dumb as shit. Like, you don't even know what the fuck is going on. And I talked to a guy, I'm not going to say who it was, not on film. I talked to a guy who's a very famous WWE guy, one of the most famous of all time. He'd come into the gym, same thing, hobbling around. I'm like, bro, I saw your highlights. You were jumping off the turnbuckle, like doing all shit. He's like, yeah, I'm on so many fucking painkillers. You have no idea. So many opiates and shit. He's like, but that's what you got to do because our bodies are so fucking wrecked. But that's also the difference between an elite level athlete and everybody else. Even doped up on enough opiates to make most of us pass the fuck out, they can still get up there and do what they need to do. People don't want to hear this shit, but that's, that's the truth. No, it's not. It's nothing new. Is it bad? No. Is it new? Like I said, I'm pro-drug. I'm actually, like, I'm pro any drug that's not going to ruin somebody's life. Like, even recreational drugs. Like, I think it, I think things like mushrooms, I think MDMA, that stuff should be legalized just like alcohol. But we need to have rules on it like alcohol. Alcohol is the worst out of all of them. But that legally is all we have. I think, I don't even like weed. But I think weed should be legalized, right? Um, like, why wouldn't it be? Like, what's what's the reference? Have you ever seen uh, a group of guys on pot break into a fight? No. Have you ever seen guys drinking get into a fight? Yeah. Like, there's no reason not to. Have you ever seen people on MDMA get into a fight or murder somebody? No, but you see that shit on alcohol, right? So if we're going to say that what makes alcohol better than these other things, right? It just doesn't make any sense. But um, And even with like performance enhancing drug TRT, I, I've, I'm supposed to be on TRT. I can't get any doctor in this country to give it to me because of the way I look. I show them my labs, I'm hypogonadal. They look at my physique and they go, I don't think you need it. Like, bro, I'm not, I don't care about the muscle. Like I care about sex drive. I care about getting a nice rock hard boner. I'm not saying I have problems with that, but just saying, I don't want there to be. Um, mood elevation, the sleep, like the protective components for the body, no doctor will listen to me. So it's like, what are my repercut? What, what are my avenues? Go do black market shit. Well, I don't have my citizenship, so that's out of the, I'm not getting caught with eggs. I don't get kicked out of the country. So, and you never know if you can trust the shit or not anyway. So it's like, but America's been far more progressive and probably in a lot of cases, too progressive, where the doctors are doing way more than they're supposed to do, but at least people have a choice there, whereas here, the government wants to restrict every fucking thing you do to protect you against shit you don't need to be protected from, right? It drives me crazy. Um, but in, in uh, Hollywood, look, plastic surgery and, uh, and performance enhancing drugs, growth hormone, testosterone, None of that's new. It's just gotten more accepted. Um, 
You think you think Tom Cruise has looked identical since he came out in Top Gun? Um, you think that was genetics? Like he's been nip tuck sucked everywhere. He's been on fucking drugs. So church, that's it. It's religion that kept him looking that way, right? It's that adrenochrome. It's all the adrenochrome. But uh, one of my mentorship students, uh, we had to do a, a call on some of this stuff because the coach was going to end up, was trying to get hooked up with a very famous person's son who was going to be in a movie, and they wanted him to look a certain way. So the coach was getting him with a doctor, or the, do the doctor that was going to be prescribing all the stuff called the coach that can you work on the that the stuff you do and I'll work on the drug stuff um, like that is there is no that, that's what's been around for ages especially the, the, how close LA is from Tijuana that easy access to, to black market shit veterinary stuff but with that type of money they don't need to like money talks right so you know it, everybody's got a price for most things, especially if you don't have any morals. But uh, I'll never understand why Australia seems to be like 20, 25 years behind everybody else with this type of stuff. It just, it's just astronomical. At least decriminalize it. Like, do it like the UK. Like, you can't buy it or sell it, but you're not punished if you have it. Unless you have enough to distribute. Uh, that's fair, right? Because then just don't get caught buying or selling it. But you get caught with a bottle. I got caught with a half bottle of testosterone one when I came into this country one time. And the reason I had it was because I had a prescription for it, but I was out of the country for longer than my bottle was going to run for. So I ended up calling a friend, and I got some in the U.K., but I didn't get a script with it. And I said, well, I already have a script for it, so surely they're not going to say anything. I was wrong. They kept me. I it took me 40 hours to get here, and they kept me in a fucking room for three and a half hours. And uh, I finally got to the, the end of it. I said, listen, guys, I've been awake for 40 hours. So I'll tell you what, either give me somewhere to sleep or arrest me and put me in a cell so I can sleep or send me to my hotel and arrest me later. I don't care what you do, but I, I can I please go to sleep? And they go, oh, we don't really arrest people for that anymore. Like, what do you do? They go, we just charge you a fine. Can I just pay the fucking fine and go? And they're like, yeah. So they charged me a fine and I left. But what sucks is I had a legal reason to have it. It's just that my bottle didn't match the, the script. Well, the line, the line should be, what is it medically prescribed for? So, now medically prescribed currently would be for people who are suffering from hypogonadism or just low testosterone for whatever reason. I think that it should be legalized also for anti-aging. That's what they did with metformin. Metformin was traditionally a diabetic drug in America a few years ago, changed the restrictions, and now you can get it for anti-aging. Women can get hormone replacement therapy. Why can't men get hormone replacement therapy? It makes no fucking sense. You can take a girl with acne, put her on birth control to control the acne, which is probably because of diet. Um, you can uh, give them synthetic progesterone and estrogen, so that they don't have to have hot flashes and, and that they get ease off menopause. Why aren't guys, why can't guys get stuff to ease off andropause? Because someone like me who's been hypogonadal since I was 36, and yeah, that was probably because of my co competition days that I did it to myself, but still I had a medical reason to do it. Um, in America, they understand that, so I get it prescribed here. No way. It'd be, it's, it's getting, there are, uh, Guys trying to get it uh, legalized, but everything here is so slow. And you know what's going to happen? They'll legalize it in ACP because they legalize everything where all the government lies first. Right? You can grow marijuana in the ACP, but you can't do it anywhere else. You get caught. Um, they'll legalize all kinds of shit there. And then 10 years later, they'll finally give it to us, right? which is so stupid. Makes me, Maybe I should just become a politician so I can uh, – so I can get get my uh, my weed, my TRT. Like this stuff here, this ring stuff is like first level shit, and it's not that difficult. Well, it's difficult right now, but um, this is kind of that basic foundation to keep getting stronger at this stuff. So then when I get further in 
the other fundamental floor stuff, then you can start transferring into actually doing the really cool, really cool uh, ring stuff. That ring plank I just did, so that's a uh, harder position. What I'm gonna do now is back off to an accessory position where I'm gonna use these straps to change the length of the, the moment arm. So if we take the straps, so, wrap them around. And these are just like normal, get these from the like Bunnings, Home Depot. You put them around like that and then you can put the strap up the forearm. What that does is it takes the leverage from here and moves it to here so you can sustain the position for a longer period of time. Um, see now, the pressure's higher up on my arm. It, I can hold this position for a lot longer period of time. So the one I did before this, I would hold that for say, 24 seconds, this would allow me to hold it for say like 36 seconds. So I can get some vo extra volume in. This type of stuff, it trains, it trains things in ways that you just can't get with traditional lifting, right? And you, you end up feeling soreness in these really weird areas. So like when I'm doing traditional work, bench press flies, all this, like chest, all of this is obviously getting doms. When I do this, I never get any doms here. I never get any feeling of anything. It's all right there. Oh, it's like it's all isolated there. As I do it, I notice, like I've never had a big chest because of the style of benching I use when I was powerlifting. It was always a closer grip, so it was mainly triceps, shoulders, and really big arch, getting a bit of lat into it. So doing this, I notice my chest actually getting wider. So you know, people argue about that. No inner outer chest, blah, blah. I get that, but something I'd really have people think about is maybe different mechanical positions may actually work different muscles at different positions and actually put more strain on sarcomeres in that, um, in that area of the muscle. So while there may not be an inner outer, upper, lower, whatever, we might actually be able to look at things from a position of straining origin of a muscle versus more towards the insertion of the muscle, right? Um, which I don't have anything scientific to back that out. I just have like anecdotal experience that, yeah, when I do this stuff, my chest tends to get wider. Um, and I have seen a lot of research regarding looking at muscle cells. So when a muscle cell contracts, people think of it as this big, like one big unit contracting, but it's actually, that muscle cell is partitioned into smaller cellular type structures called sarcomeres. Those sarcomeres are then separated by a Z-disc. Those Z-discs are actually what moves. So all of those individual sarcomeres, they're the ones that are contracting and, ex and, and extending or shortening and lengthening. It's not really the whole muscle. So some of the stuff I've talked to with some guys that are way above my scope of knowledge, like scientists and shit, uh, talking about when, they, when they've gotten to the point where they're now putting like, like small, tiny microscopes in the tissue and watching things contract, what they've noticed now is that not our sarcomeres shorten at the same speed or at, at the same amount. So depending on the load, depending on the position of the limbs, depending on where you're placing the, the area of resistance, it seems that some sarcomeres will shorten more than others. So in a position like this, where you're here and everything's wanting to go this way, there could be possibly, it's conjecture right now for me, there, we could have a thought process that the m majority of the muscle is actually working here, not actually working here, right? But um, I guess time will tell. But I, I, I always remember Charles talking about the, uh, guys could call it the Gironda M EMG technique, or I guess I would call it the junkyard EMG technique, right? So people put electrodes up and they look at muscle stimulation. He goes, you wanna know what's working in a muscle, just do 10 sets as heavy as you can and see where it hurts the next day. I'm like, that's, that's pretty good, you know? And people go, well, that's not scientific, but people, 
people lean way too much on exercise science right now and they don't experiment. Like all the stuff that gets researched in, uh, in exercise science is basically, okay, let's see what people have used in the past and let's, let's try to quantify that data. Let's try to disprove or you know, try to get a deeper understanding how this stuff works. So there's, we know a lot less about how things work than we think we do and more stuff is being found all the time because um, diagnostic equipment gets better, techniques get better, w you know, understanding like components of cells gets better. There's a lot of stuff that rapidly changes. So maybe that old bodybuilder thing about inner, outer, upper, lower, whatever, lower biceps, upper biceps, maybe there is something to that. We just, you know, who, do we have the, do, have we have found a relevant way to actually test and uh, quantify that or not? Well, the thing is, I think it's better to think about the question like this. Like, if we're gonna say evidence-based practice, what does that actually mean? Because that can mean a lot of different things. That could mean experience under the bar and, and observing things, which people go, well, you get some guys who go, well, anecdotes aren't scientific, but that, that is ba the prime, that's the prime first step of uh, the scientific method, right? I observe something happening, we try to come up with some type of theory or hypothesis of why that's happening, and then we test it to try to see, try to falsify or try to see if we're on the right track with that. So when we look at, and research is still massively important, like we don't wanna take away from that, but we also need to keep it in context that when things are being researched, limited funds to research things. Think about like cancer. How much money pours into cancer research? Bazillions of fucking dollars. Bazillions of dollars every year. Do we have a cure for cancer? No. Okay, so now think about how little money is going into nutritional exercise science. It's paltry in comparison to Parkinson's, cancer, fibromyalgia, all these things that we pour far more money and we still have no fucking clue, right? So. If we pour that much money and that much research into these things that are life debilitating or killing people and we still don't have a clue, if we're pouring a fraction, fraction of a fraction in that into sports, physical stuff, nutrition, we're gonna assume that we know even less about fucking exercise than we think we do, right? Until we can pour bazillions into that, but that's not, not obviously not as important as saving people's lives, right? So what I would look at is what I got from Laurent Bannock is don't be evidence-based, be, uh, what the fuck he says, uh, don't be evidence-based, be evidence-informed. So it's like you have to stay with current literature because you find a lot of clues in that, but also you gotta understand the limitations of science, right? So if you s get a study and if you're an abstract reader, so you read the abstract and you say, oh, okay, that puts a nail in the coffin. Okay, go read the study and you see there's 12 limitations. There are 18 people in the study. Three of them dropped out. The study was three weeks in length. Um, they didn't, they looked at exercise, but they didn't uh, account for nutrition. They didn't account for sleep and lifestyle. It's like, wow, there's so much, there's so much shit wrong with that study that you can't make a conclusion of finality from that. You can only look for clues and then go to the gym and try it out with all your clients and see who it works for, who it doesn't work for, right? So like uh, I don't use, I use reps and reserve and RPE for really advanced clients, but I use it very sparingly. My clients will tell you, I almost still use percentages or rep ranges. I gauge failure by technical failure and or speed failure. Because when we look at like failure, people, that's a big hot topic now. Don't train to failure. What is your, okay, no one's answering the question. What are we deeming as failure? Are we talking total concentric failure? Are we talking about isometric failure? Are we talking about eccentric failure? Are we talking about technical failure? What are we talking about? So it's like, if somebody's, for me, if somebody's movement breaks down, more than like 10% from the first rep, that's technical failure. They, to me, they are at failure because it's now no longer the same exercise. So if I do a set of 12 
and 10 reps look really nice and that ninth or 10th rep starts to slow down the 10th rep gets really slow the 11th is super slow and they start to lean and torque that's failure they failed on the 10th rep because that 11th rep shouldn't have been done that is a difference in accumulating fatigue than somebody doing like going to complete concentric failure where they just can't fucking push their bar anymore so there needs to be bigger conversations on if you're going to say rp and rir is the way to go and that's what the research says what are you dictating as failure because we have to understand that first because my version of technical failure is probably a one to two rir anyways so why do i need to leave that subjectively to the client when they know when they fall out of position or they know when a lift is so slow there's no way they're going to get another one like to me those are more quantifiable metrics than going mm, i think i got three more in there and put the bar down they probably had eight more reps in there right? so a lot of people to me aren't getting the most out of their training especially when you have limited training time because they're not pushing to a point where they're actually squeezing out every piece of gain that they could possibly get from the movement uh, and i i I, don't have, I haven't had arguments with friends about this, but other other high-level guys in the industry, you know, they, they like to use that, and I think that's great. I find it didn't work for me, right? Um, because unless you're dealing with somebody who is there, who has actually dumped a back squat, they have no idea what where their failure point is. So um, everybody's scared of fatigue right now. Like, you know how you overcome fatigue? You train through fatigue, then you recover, and now you have a new you have a new range for fatigue. Like if you're constantly avoiding fatigue, you're always going to get fatigue. It's just like any other adaptation. So like, you know, I don't have a problem training 15, 21 hours a week sometimes. Do you think that's not fatiguing? Of course it's fatiguing, but you just don't do that forever. You push yourself to the point where you can't recover from the fatigue, and then then you recover. So. Uh, the industry is like it's just it's really it's just a really weird industry because everybody spouts off opinions and they don't sit around thinking about it enough or they just repeat other people who aren't thinking enough you talk to guys that are old school like when i we didn't fucking worry about fatigue we just trained until we fucking couldn't train anymore and then we recovered from it and then we recovered we trained until we couldn't recover anymore and then we recovered from it we never never talked about fatigue. I didn't even hear about that being talked about until a couple of years ago. What the fuck are you guys worried about fatigue? Like, like you think world champions care about fatigue? I mean, nobody becoming a world champion worried about fucking fatigue, right? You know, world champions using ice baths to be a world champion, right? Um, it just it's insane to me, like what people will argue about here, uh, and how they'll allow that bias to take up their entire they 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 form a whole identity around that thing like they become known as the like the uh the guy who only does warm-up sets for his work sets it's like no wonder you're not fucking strong no wonder your physique hasn't changed in a few years right you don't push yourself like everything in life worth having comes with a cost so if you're trying to progress and you're not kind of skating on that edge you're probably not getting the results you want and it's really bad in gym pop because they think just getting the reps done with a little bit of weight is enough. Yeah, you know, it makes you feel better. Pat yourself on the back a little bit. But when you start training and really going for the results and really getting out of your comfort zone, that's when you really see the results starting to happen. And that's when you come to that realization of how much work it takes. You're not going to reap rewards without work. Um, we had that the group training like that was the biggest thing people said to me is i was pushing people pushing people hard in their workout probably harder than they've ever worked out before and they were all like oh man i've never worked out that hard i'm like yeah that's what it takes if you want to optimize your time in here and nobody came to group classes that week because they were too fucking sore i'm like okay train like this more often the soreness will go away over time and you'll actually give your body a reason to grow, reason to get strong. And then you'll start enjoying a little bit of soreness every now and then, but people don't train hard enough. That's the fact. I'm done. <laughs>